welcome to a special Sunday edition of the Knights of Last Call. My name is Derek Melinda, and I'm excited to be here with you on this uh, Easter Sunday. Hope all of you had a lovely weekend, whether you uh, celebrate or not. Uh, time with family, time with friends, or just uh, just time for yourself. All of that is all fantastic. So hopefully you're all doing very well. Very happy to be joining you all today. Thanks to the incredible, amazing, and beneficent support of viewers like yourself, members of the Knights of Last Call Patreon, and of course, our incredible and wonderful audience who continually supports this show. Last Thursday, we had a goal, which was, hey, if we can reach our, our tip goal, we'll do a Sunday stream. We'll focus on a system deep dive. Um, and uh, yeah, we will... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I, I got distracted. Someone said that the video is stuck. I don't know. Um, hopefully someone can respond and let me know if that's the case. Um, <laughs> anyways, <laughs> the, uh, the the patrons uh, voted for what system we would be doing, and it was a very close poll. There was a couple of, of uh, options, which were getting some pretty good clout, and ultimately it was kind of a, of a neck and neck race. In fact, it ended up being a tie between Dungeons and Dragons 4th edition and Avatar Legends, the new role-playing game from Magpie Games, which came out last year. And since we have covered 4th edition a little bit on this channel before, we did a, a whole stream on it once, um, I figured we'd give the nod to Avatar and we would kind of talk about uh, Avatar today. So, uh, yeah, here we are, uh, ready, to, uh, <laughs> ready to discuss Avatar Legends. So hopefully everybody is doing really well. And... Um, I'm going to wait uh, for a few minutes just to get some people a chance to kind of come in here. Um, so while we're waiting for everybody to kind of show up, hopefully uh, if there's any questions that anybody has, please feel free to ask. I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, but what I will talk about in the meantime is what uh, the intention of today's stream is, because uh, I need your help to keep this active, uh, you know, this, this kind of stream uh, on topic and, and heading towards the right direction. So I guess one thing I want to do is I kind of want to teach you how to play Avatar, the last airbender or Avatar Legends, the role playing game. And I want to talk about what this game does, what this game is about, what would a game of Avatar Legends look like? What should it look like? Um, I can tell you that this is a very purposeful game. It is designed to create or emulate a certain type of play pattern, a certain type of play experience. And you're gonna see that the mechanics of the game are designed to not only push you towards a certain direction, but also, um, uh, you know, trying to actively fight against those mechanics is actually gonna create a lot of problems for you. And I think that's uh, a good thing. Uh, it's not a system that's designed for every day use. It's not a system that you can just kind of drop in and use as a generic system. Um, <laughs> Frost Jack says lots of use of, of the stand target soundbite today. Um, I actually don't think I have that one on my board right now. Um, uh, cause I, I took one of my, my stream decks up to the studio, but, um, uh, but yes, that is the, that is the basic idea. Um, unfortunate pumpkin says, I'm in a 4E game and an Avatar Legends game, so also running a game of Avatar Legends. I'm familiar with both, but I think 4E deserves the love more. Um, sure. I, I think we'll definitely get to 4th edition, but we've already done, you know, three or four hours on 4th edition, so I think we can we can afford to spend a couple hours talking about Avatar. Mm. Good stuff. Um, all right, so... Let's uh, let's get into it here. I don't know if we're gonna whiteboard. We might end up whiteboarding. Um, maybe we will. Uh, you know, never far from my mind. Um, the let me get my white. Let me let me get the whiteboard out. Let me just get it up, just in case. You know, just in case. Okay, here. What did we have our last thing here? It was Zebra Wrangler, I believe. All right. There she is. Okay. 
so all right so i guess the one of the things that we have to kind of think about here is um what uh what kind of game or what kind of system is Avatar Legends? Let's start with that. Um, and again, I am going to assume here for a moment that you all... Um, Jesus. No, jeez. All right. Sorry. Everything was all screwed up. So I guess real quick, we're going to kind of talk about, real quick, just about sort of, uh, you know, PBTA uh, in general. Um, and what does it mean to be powered by the apocalypse and sort of what are the sort of the core assumptions that we're going to be uh, using in this game? So as a basic idea, and I, again, um, I don't want to get distracted with PBTA concepts, but um, <laughs> I think it's important because of, of terminology and the way that uh, PBTA, I think, uses its terminology very badly. And I think that creates a lot of problems in the game space, which leads to unfortunate misuse of the system. Um, so everybody is generically fairly, can, you know, PBTA isn't really a system. It's an idea, it's a concept, it's a philosophy. And there's a lot of different ways that you can implement that philosophy. But one of the, when people say PBTA, one of the most common things that they think about is this idea of you're gonna be rolling, you're gonna be rolling 2d6, you're going to be adding some sort of modifier, such as from a stat or an ability score, and that's going to give you a range of values. And typically, they the way that these things are referred to is a 1 to 6 uh, on your 2d6. I guess that would be a 2 to 6. Is called a miss. And then a 7. Oh, my gosh. That's a giant 7. A 7 or higher. Okay, is called a hit. And the games usually, therefore, then go kind of further into describing that a 7 to 9, aka a 7, 8, or 9, is what they call a weak hit. And a 10 or higher is called a strong hit. Now, this is part of the problem with uh, Powered by the Apocalypse language, which is calling these things hits and misses I think is very damaging and doesn't really explain or properly do a good job of explaining what any of this stuff means um because part of it is because when you know the game was created we you know you were trying to reach an audience of predominantly d20 based gaming and we are just used to this this concept of misses and hits and so they use this similar language, but it's really bad uh, because it doesn't really it doesn't really apply to anything that these things do at all. Um, because missing, we associate missing with um, basically doing nothing, right? If we miss or we fail a a check uh, in in a T twenty game, right? Like the 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 general, usually what happens is nothing happens. Uh, we fail to climb the wall. We miss the opponent and nothing bad happens to us, right? We just, we, the, the, the net result of our action was nothing happened. So a lot of, you know, I see KC says, why not success or failure? Because honestly, KC, that's not right either. Um, and again, I, I don't want to spend too much of this time on PBTA philosophy, but I do think it is kind of important to sort of, uh, sort of talk about Mr. Korback, by the way, welcome. Uh, Look at you catching the live stream. Uh, I'm very happy for you to be here. Rivo, good to see you, buddy. Happy Easter to those who celebrate. I'll try to catch up as soon as I'm home. Wonderful. Awesome. Um, Mr. Korback showing his support for the whiteboard as well. So, yeah. So you might say, okay, well, okay. I'm not a miss then. Okay. So we'll call that failure. But see, that's not right either. And the reason why that's not right is because we are the... <laughs> We are used to thinking about RPG mechanics as being a form of a physics engine, right? We are used to an RPG system being a representation of there's this concept of how difficult something is, 
and that difficulty is ascribed to its real, real, to its real world properties, right? Um, to climb a wall that is full of jagged handholds is going to be easier than a wall that is smooth as ice. And we represent this with a lower or higher number or difficulty class or target number that we need to roll and we need to roll higher in order to do better. But if our character is better at climbing or they are uh, stronger, they will have a higher bonus and therefore they will be more likely to succeed at a task which is more difficult. Uh, or I should say they, they'd be more likely to succeed at all tasks related to that uh, challenge. And that comes out as a percentage. So essentially these dice mechanics in a D20 game are a simulation engine. They are designed to model a real world set of, of, of properties. PBTA, I would say, does not do this. And I think the game doesn't always do a great job of, of explaining that because what the PBTA mechanic is actually trying to do is it is all that it is simply trying to determine is what are the what are the or who I should say probably maybe even who and what are the consequences for you taking an action so it's not about whether you succeed or fail and certainly your character's ability to succeed or fail and the, the inherent difficulty of a task has nothing to do with it. In fact, there are no difficulty classes in Powered by the Apocalypse. In our example, climbing a very, very, very jagged wall in Powered by the Apocalypse would use this same system of one to six, seven to nine, 10 or higher, as would climbing a wall that was perfectly smooth. What we are, the only thing we are interested, we're not interested in simulating how what is the probability that our character will succeed or not, or fail, or miss, or hit? All we are interesting, interested in is in deciding who or what in the narrative sort of gets to control the action next. Now, I think Thirsty Sword Lesbians does this the best. Um, they use the term for a one to six. They use the term downbeat. <laughs> um which is from Thirsty Sword Lesbians, and they call a 10 plus an upbeat, and they call a seven through nine a mixed beat. And by beat, they mean like the story beat, right? Like it's, it's a moment in the story where we get to this point where we want to determine is something going to be, uh, is something going to go the player's way or is something going to go not the player's way? And so in PBTA, we would roll at this point and we would determine whether or not this is a moment where the players are sort of, uh, you know, have an upbeat in the story. Things break their way. They get a moment of success. They get a moment of, of, uh, of true victory. Or it might be a downbeat, a moment where, you know, hope seems to falter and things seem to get more difficult and the challenges continue to escalate and pile up. Or it could be something in between where one success, uh, you know, leads to the next issue, which then propels this sort of narrative, cinematic, you know, TV, movie, book, whatever, you know, forward. Um, and so I think that's a better way to understand how PBTA works, because the way that I kind of think about it, even from like a game master's perspective, is um, I really think of it as when you know in pbta we are having you know what's called a conversation all right and the conversation um it might be between let's say you know the pcs and the gm and we're both going back and forth and we're describing what what we're doing in this sort of you know world of avatar that we're in um, and the GM is responding with, you know, answers, maybe role playing as a character, maybe describing something in the uh, in the world. And everything is, is pretty good. And it's it's hard to say who really is in control here. It's kind of like 
we're both equally on the same footing um, because the players are getting to decide what they can decide, whatever they can do, whatever they want to do. And as a GM, I can respond with however I want to respond, which is great. It's pretty normal for a D, you know, for any sort of RPG. Um, you know, PPTA is really big about the conversation and it's this back and forth moment between the GM and the PCs. But what will happen is, and this varies from PBTA game to PBTA game, is that conversation will eventually lead to a moment of uncertainty. And it'll lead to a moment of uncertainty. And it's got to be one that the game actually cares about. Okay. There's always going to be moments of uncertainty where a player describes them doing something. Um, and the GM says, I don't know what might happen in this moment. Now, this is where you have to know where and how the game works. Um, in most PBTA games, we refer to things like the, what are called the basic moves to understand when the mechanics need, or in fact, I, you're, it's not even you know uh, that you want them to intercede. They must intercede in these moments of uncertainty. In Avatar Legends, we can see that the basic moves show us that the moments of uncertainty that this game cares about are things like when we rely on our skills and training to overcome an obstacle, gain a new insight, or perform a familiar custom, or if we try to guide and comfort someone, when we try to honestly guide and comfort another person, then we must make a move. The game is saying, this is what this particular game system cares about. These are the moments when you are pleading or pressing your luck or pushing your luck, when you are intimidating someone or tricking someone, when you are using your skills or training or when you are trying to assess a situation. This is where the game is saying that is when the mechanics enter the equation. So to be very clear about this, it, it is not a mechanics forward game because this is my second big bugaboo about Power by the Apocalypse games. They call these things moves, and I think that that is a horrible name for them. Because if you read them, and even if you're used to Pathfinder 2, you'll realize they read more like triggers. They are really more like kind of like game mechanical reactions. You don't actually, I mean, yes, you might want a certain move to trigger. You might want this rules text to apply. And the game though is going to say, well, in order to do that, and if you want to guide and comfort someone, then you need to, in our conversation that is happening, you need to honestly guide and comfort another person. Now, this is where the game, you know, can be kind of like, you know, Dungeon World and Powered by the Apocalypse have this principle, never speak your move, right? And the idea is, we were just playing Pathfinder 2 this last Friday, okay? Um, and, you know, we we're playing Ab Abomination Vaults and, you know, we're playing, we got our grid and the minis and the combat broke out with a couple corpse lights down on level uh, four, which is great. And, you know, it's pretty simple for someone to pick up their mini and go, okay, I'm gonna stride over here or I'm gonna move over here and I'm gonna, you know, strike with my hammer. They are describing their term in the terms of, you know, guy in, in the terms of mechanics. They are not really describing, we're not having a conversation, okay? They are just mechanically describing things. Now, of course, we all know that role-playing games are a lot more fun when people describe things and when we actually, you know, kind of get into it and have like a little bit more of, you know, what we call the fluffy bullshit time sprinkled on top. That makes it a lot more entertaining and a lot more fun, a lot more memorable. But ultimately, it's not really essential or critical to the game. All the Powered by the Apocalypse game is trying to say is that the mechanics should come in second to what is happening. You and me should be having a conversation about what's happening in the game. So for example, I might say, um, you know, okay, Hoshi, you know, when you enter the room, you can see that everything in the room is destroyed. You can see signs of fire 
uh, singed, uh, you know, material all over the room. And you can see that your sister is in the corner sobbing quietly in the middle of sort of an area of devastation. And you realize, you know, she's had another, um, you know, or, or better yet, I might just say, you know, so what do you do? And um, the player might say, uh, okay, well, I'm going to, I'm going to go over to my sister. I realize she's had another um, outburst, another, maybe another surge in her power that she can't control. I'm going to go over to her and I'm going to put my hand on her shoulder and I'm going to say, you know, tell her, you know, Kaya, listen, none of this is your fault. And then right, we're having a conversation. We're role playing. We're FBTing. We're describing our actions. But this is where as a player and as a GM, you do need to be aware of what is going on in the game. Because at that point, as a GM or even as a player, I might say, you know, the, the person describes how they're putting their hand on their sister's shoulder and says, you know, Kaya, this isn't your fault. And I might turn to the player and say, okay, are, are, are you trying, you know, are you guiding and comforting her? And the player says, yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm trying to guide and comfort her. And I say, great, awesome. Grab your 2d6 and roll and roll with harmony. So you're going to add your harmony stat to this 2d6 roll. And then we are going to follow the rules text. And the reason why this is so much fun is because this is a moment of uncertainty for all of us. It's a moment of uncertainty for you, the player. It's a moment of uncertainty for me, the game master. I don't know how Kaya is going to respond. None of us do. None of us know how Hoshi is going to, to get across. And instead of the game worry, because that's, to be fair, you might say, well, that we could do that in a D20 game. It's true, you can. But in a D20 game, I have to come in there and I have to say, well, how, what's the DC? How, how upset is Kaya? How good is Hoshi at, you know, guiding and comforting somebody? Are they trained in this skill? Um, and I, I'm putting in all this like simulationist bias to try to understand how hard it would be for us to guide and comfort my sister, or I should say Hoshi's sister. But PBTA games don't care about that. It says, look, that's why we don't use DCs here. We're not really interested in perfectly replicating how hard something is or how hard something isn't. Generally speaking, if something would be so easy that the, basically in, in PBTA games, you basically have three outcomes. The either the GM says, that's not a move because it's so easy and successful. There's no reason that we would roll. The GM says that is so obviously and completely, totally a success. There's no need to roll. So it's either no roll because it's going to happen automatically or no roll because it's impossible to happen. And then anything in the middle, which has some uncertainty that we think is important and the game matters or the game cares about, that is when we would roll these dice. So hopefully that makes some sense. So in other words, we reach this moment of uncertainty and it's not a, at this point, the conversation, right? Between the players and the GM, we have been equal, right? I'm describing what's happening. The player describes what's happening. I respond what's happening in kind. The player comes in or maybe let's, you know, we could even do this a, a different way. You know, the Hoshi, the player walks into the room, sees that it's been destroyed by fire. I describe that his sister Kaya is standing you know, or us uh, kneeling on the ground, head in hands, sobbing quietly. And, you know, Hoshi's character says, you know, I enter and I say, you know, Kaya, are, are you okay? And then I respond as Kaya, you know, and I say, just go away, go away before I hurt anyone else, right? We're, we're having a conversation. We're going back and forth and back and forth. And then Hoshi, PC says, no, I'm gonna walk up to her, put my hand on her shoulder and say, Kaya, this isn't your fault, none of this is your fault. And then again, we're, we're, all we're doing is having a conversation and there's, there's no re in, in, in any other game, you would just, you could keep having that conversation, right? The GM could respond with what Kaya says. They might think, well, I really know what Kaya is. And I really know how she is responding. And I really know, I know a lot about that character. And so I'm just going to respond back and I'm just going to role play. And we're just going to role play out this encounter. And that is how a lot of people play their D20 games. And I don't fundamentally think that there's anything wrong with that. 
But what I am trying to tell you is that in a PBTA game, the same way that Pathfinder 2 or 5th edition, you know, cares about um, how good your attack bonus is or, you know, in Pathfinder 2, like, oh, I'm going to try to flank in this combat because that's going to give me a better chance of success. The mechanics in PBTA, they care about how that NPC, how your sister is going to respond to the player's attempt to guide and comfort them. And instead of the GM just getting to make it up, this is where PBTA steps in and says, no, 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 no. Everyone follows the rules here, including, dare I say, especially the GM. So we're going to roll and we are going to use that as a determination for what happens here next. And basically in this moment of uncertainty, what we are trying to resolve is who, who kind of, you know, if, if a conversation is sort of a, you know, is sort of a dance, who gets to take the lead next, right? Who gets the lead at this moment of uncertainty? So when our player playing Hoshi uh, or Hitoshi, I can't remember the name I gave them, um, makes their guide and comfort move, they are going to roll with 2d6 and they're going to roll plus harmony. And it says on a hit, on a hit, they choose one, um, you know, some rules text. This is actually, you know, rules text, um, you know, on a 10 or higher, which by the way, a hit means they got a seven or higher, right? That's what we determine hit means. So we said on a seven or higher, they get to basically, uh, the, the person, my, me, the sister, I get to pick between one of these two options. Um, and then on a 10 plus, if you get a 10 plus, if they embrace your guidance, you can also shift their balance. But what if you get a six minus? What if you get a one to six here? Does that mean nothing happens? No. What a six minus means is that the GM gets to take charge of the situation. So that is why, you know, and the idea typically is that the GM is going to do something that is going to make the player's life a little bit more complicated or a lot bit more complicated. And yes, this is a narrative game. It is not necessarily a simulationist game. Because remember, this check, this harmony check to determine if we are going to guide or comfort someone has very little to do with how upset is Kaya? How good is this person at talking to people? How, you know, it, none of the simulationist aspects matter. The only thing that this die roll is doing is sort of saying, what does the next scene in our story look like? Is it going to be a downbeat? Or is it going to be an upbeat? Or is it going to be something in between? So we could imagine a world where you roll, a, let's say, a nine. And that means it's a hit, but you did not roll a 10 or higher. And so if we look at our, our rule here, or our uh, uh, the rules text for this uh, move, we can see that they, meaning the character, in this case, the NPC, gets to choose one. They can either shut you down or they can embrace your guidance and comfort. This is the GM's call. The GM gets to make this decision. Um, but you'll notice that regardless of which one I choose, um, that NPC is going to be affected, right? Um, they're either gonna be able to clear a condition or too, too fatigue. And if I do that, then they can ask them a question and I have to answer honestly, or I could choose to shut down my brother. Kaya could choose to shut him down. But if I do that, I can put a condition onto my brother, which is a mechanical thing in the game, and they can shift my characters, my NPC's balance, which is a big part of what this game is. So either way, the character is sort of getting what they want. Um, they, they've hit, right? They have achieved some amount of success. And so let's say I choose, um, you know, uh, the first one where I describe her saying, you know, she reaches up her hand, she grabs your hand on her shoulder. Um, she lets out a horrible, you know, kind of muffled cry and starts sobbing. And at that moment, 
uh, I might say, okay, she's going to clear one of the conditions that's on her. She was um, upset. She was afraid. She was angry. And then the PC gets to ask them a question, honestly. So very, 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 you know, uh, very, very simple, straightforward response. But what if we rolled a six minus in this situation? What then? The rules don't tell us what to do. Well, this is where PBTA says, this is kind of where the GM gets to make the decision. If, if it's a seven or higher, the basically the player, the PC kind of gets the next move, right? For a brief moment, the rules of the game step in and say, I know that you guys were having a conversation before and that both of you were on even footing. But when we get to a moment of uncertainty that the game cares about, we're gonna interject mechanics. And in that moment, depending on what happens with the dice, if you get a seven or higher, the PC is kind of empowered. They get to make, they get to make the next, you know, the next action. They get to make the next decision. Things are gonna go kind of their way for a brief moment. And the GM kind of doesn't get to say anything about it. Right. This is where the, the PBTA games basically say the GM is beholden to the rules as well. On the other hand, if we roll a six or lower, then the GM gets the power. So when you roll, we are determining basically who gets to kind of decide which way the story goes next. When the PC, when the PC risks a role, they are risking that if I roll well enough, my player character and my fellow PCs are going to be able to kind of shape the story in a way that the rules support. And in fact, the rules demand that the story moves in this direction. But if I roll six minus, then as the GM, I get to step in for once and say, no, 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 I have the power here. I get to decide what happens in this story next. And as a GM, I have my principles and my agendas, my roles, responsibilities, and goals. What am I trying to do in this game? Like, for example, and this is this is again where, you know, you know, mind explosion. Since this isn't a simulationist role, since we aren't trying to model an outcome, it is merely telling us. The next scene in the story, is it a downbeat or is it an upbeat? If Hoshi comes in, Kaya has just had another episode. She's, you know, destroyed the home. She's destroyed the, you know, let's say they're staying at an inn or a tavern. She's destroyed the room. Everything is singed or burned or destroyed. Her brother, a PC, comes in, tries to guide and comfort her. Hoshi rolls horribly. The player rolls a one and a two, gets a three. Their harmony stat is only plus one or plus two. They get a five, it's a six minus. And that means that the spotlight ships to me as a GM. And basically the game, you know, it has some guidelines, it has some rules and restrictions to a certain extent. But I, the GM, at this moment, get to decide what happens. And it, it stops becoming a conversation at this point. Anonymous and becomes five dollars my chance just getting into to style games i feel like this style of game is something i'll really enjoy picked up a pdf of earlier today to put in the queue thanks for the dive thank you for that tip anonymous i um, not sure if you dr forgot to drop your name but you can let us know in chat but um thank you for that uh appreciate it yeah I, I i think this type of game is not for everybody but for the people who it does work for i think a lot of people are surprised to determine that this is kind of what they wanted out of their rpg system anyways um, so thank you very much for that. Um, yeah, by the way, we kind of dive right into it. The goal tonight is just, uh, oh, that was Entheo. Okay. Thank you, Entheo. <laughs> uh, awesome. Yeah. And I, I actually completely agree with you, Entheo. I think that is entirely what GM you should be. Hey, $100 just got home from doing family <laughs> stuff. Thanks for this deep dive. Here's to another one. GM Scott. Well, thank you, uh, for blowing that goal out of the water. GM Scott. Thank you. Entheo. Thank you. Um, you guys are fantastic. GM Scott, uh, you know, um, I know that you uh, have really started to embrace this kind of gaming and really trying to uh, add this element, sort of bringing your group along with you. And so I think GM Scott is is a great sort of role model for us in terms of understanding how 
these concepts and ideas can become more and more, you know, sort of added. I know GM Scott's adding third or starting to play 13th age with their group and GM Scott group is kind of being dragged into it and 13th age is kind of like an intermediary step as you move through this and i think the goal if i recall scott is that you eventually want to get to scum and villainy um which i think is a fantastic game um but thank you so much for that happy easter to you and your family gm scott and i really look forward to uh to buying you several rounds of drinks uh in columbus um <laughs> come 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 origins <laughs> thank you so much um Okay, yeah, he said 13th Age was a big hit. We had our first session last week. That's that's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, Mighty Dave says, Law, uh, this game sounds like how people describe playing 5e. Yes, exactly, Mighty Dave, exactly. And I agree with Frostjack. A lot of people who play 5e would have a better time with PBTA. Um, and I completely agree with Pumpkin. I know, I know, Pum I know. Pumpkin has heard me say this before. Yeah, uh, a lot of people feel like playing 5e, like Critical Role should actually be playing PBTA. I think I think if, if Critical Role was playing a PBTA game like this, I think it, it would be 500 times more interesting. Um, so um, thank you again to Entheo. Thank you again to GM Scott, our new hype boss leader. Um, thank you to everybody. Uh, I was going to say tonight's goal is really just sort of out there as a sort of a, of a appreciation or thank you. Again, this goal was brought to you by the uh, the stream and the Patreon. So thank you for that continued support. And um, we'll, we'll continue to dive, dive right back into it. Um, if you do want to show your support, tipping through our stream elements tip, there's a link in the description below. You can also use super chat function. But if you want to join this conversation and you're interested in this, maybe you're watching this you know, a couple days from now and you're kind of interested in all these people and the conversations that we're having every single day, these are the, the men and women and, and folks of the Knights of Last Call Discord, the Knights of Last Call Patreon. And all of that is tied to our uh, Patreon page, patreon.com slash Knights of Last Call. And so... If you're interested in being a part of this community and really getting involved with these conversations, I really encourage you to check it out. We have a link below. And um, you know, thank you. If you're even watching this video, remember to like and subscribe. And if you want to make be notified every time we go live, click the bell. Um, yeah, we are pretty cool, Jackal. I think I think we're pretty cool. Um, uh, GM Scott, I think, yeah, I think that's also very smart, GM Scott. That's another fantastic in fact like maybe 13th age into dungeon world into scum and villainy is sort of like a natural it's like boil the frog um if you've never seen that website go to it i think you might have to google it i don't know if it's boil the frog.com but boil the frog is a website where you give it one band and another band and it figures out like what are the bands that you have to listen to, to in order to sort of you know you know like um artistically get from one band to the next through a series of intermediary bands. Um, so what I wanted to point out here is again, this is where people's mind or head can be kind of really, oh, Xander, <laughs> thank you Xander. It's thanks to this kind of lives that our group swapped to a cyberpunk fit. Much mm. better for us. Thanks you for the good work. Awesome, yeah, that's fantastic. Are you playing, um, are you playing like uh, uh, Hack the Planet or, or Sprawl? Xander, thank you for the tip. Um, I'm just kind of curious which game you're actually playing. You said Cyberpunk, but I the one I know is Hack the Planet, but I'm curious if that's the one you're using. Thank you so much for that support. Um, and I'm happy we were able to influence you. Hopefully you guys are having a good time with your new game and, and enjoying what you're doing over there. Um, so uh, we get this six minus. The GM gets the power. I get to decide what happens next. Now, this is where... Again, your mind has to sort of think outside uh, of of the uh, uh, box a little bit, right? Because you know, I could say, uh, I, really honestly, this this is why I like playing these games. Because look, I, I've got ideas too. I've got I, they're fun things that I want to do to make life more interesting and more challenging. And you know, I kind of want really to fudge. Right? Don't we, I mean, look at, don't we all kind of want to fudge? And, and I mean this in sort of like, I, I mean this in a, in a, in a real benefit, you know, sort of like a very like magnanimous and caring way. When I play D20 games, I, you know, the dice are being rolled, I'm rolling them out front, and I am doing my best to play the rules of the game as written. But of course, there are moments where I look down and I say, 
oh, it would be so cool if blank and blank and blank, right? Oh, it would be so fun if like the really interesting thing happened right here. But I'm playing D20 and they rolled what they rolled and I rolled what I rolled. Or more importantly, I'm trying to respect that this game cares about things like what is in the next room for real? Like it would be really awesome at this moment if, you know, some that PC's sister showed up. But that would be sort of breaking the sort of verisimilitude of what we're trying to do here in this game, right? The players are making decisions on the basis that the world around them is logical and makes sense and is kind of like a simulation of a real environment, of a real world. And I wanna respect that because I don't wanna shit on their agency, but sometimes that means that the, you know, interesting outcome is not something that you can do. It's not something that is available to you. And so when I think about this moment, I might have some really cool ideas for this moment. We reach this critical juncture, maybe not in the campaign, but certainly in maybe tonight's session, which is can, you know, you know, the, the, the group came here to try to, uh, you know, figure out what was going on with Hoshi's sister. And they figured, you know, all this stuff out. And she had another attack or another outburst in, in, you know, sort of in the in room where she's been hiding and staying. Maybe she ran away from her family, et cetera, et cetera. So this is like a critical moment. And I have interesting ideas, things that I would like to see happen, but I am not going to just cheat the game and make them happen. I am going to respect that we are gonna have this sort of back and forth, a real conversation, not just a monologue, not just me vomiting out whatever cool things I think are gonna be interesting, what I think is fun. Because as much as I want my interesting ideas to take a part in the game, I also understand that if I do that, then it's not our game, right? It's my game, it's my story. And I don't want that. I want it to be a back and forth. I want everyone to be inputting it. I want it to be a collaborative process. But what is cool about PBTA is when you get to these moments of uncertainty and you make the move, when the seven or higher comes along as a GM, I have to just step back and say, look, the player, they, they got their role. They made it, they got their hit. They get to do something in the game, in the narrative, in the mechanics that they, they won. They get, they get their little prize. They get their moment in the sun. The thing that they wanted to have happen gets to happen. But when we get a six minus, it's like the ball is in my court. I got the rebound. And now it's my opportunity, you know, to show off and to shine. And this is a moment where as a GM, adhering to my principles and agendas, I can make the game, you know, with a little Derek flair. And this is, by the way, a great moment of distinction between how GMs run Powered by the Apocalypse game and why some GMs might not be comfortable running a Powered by the Apocalypse game. Because when you roll a six minus, there are so many different options that we could do. For starters, as a GM, I'm not honor bound to make this horrible and painful. I could make it uh, soft and subtle, but I am, in fact, this is why I said calling it a failure, right? is not the right term. Calling it a miss is not the right term. Because when it's a six minus, it's like the GM gets to decide what happens next. That's really what it comes down to. The GM gets to decide what happens next. So let me give you an example of this. Hoshi comes in. He wants to make peace with his sister. She had another outburst. He comes in, he says some nice words to her, puts his hands on her shoulder and says, this is not your fault. And then we reach this moment of uncertainty. They make the roll and they biff it. They get a five. But I'm the GM. I get to decide what happens next, okay? Uh, Sean, uh, a very good point. Some moves do have mechanical elements that you must follow with a six minus. That does happen from time to time, and that is important to note. But what I could do in this moment is, as a GM, I get to decide what happens. I think, you know what? This was a tender moment. And I think the player did a good job. So I'm gonna say, 
I'm going to say there, there's two outcomes from this. Okay. I'm going to say Kaya uh, accepts. Right. So I describe, you know, he places a hand on her sister's shoulder. And I say through her muddled cries, she reaches out, touches your hand, looks up at you with tears in her eyes. And she says, you know, oh, Hoshi, thank you for never giving up on me. But what am I going to do? Right. And like, it's a moment of, yep, you, you broke, you got through to her. You know, you, you connected with her. I'm giving you that because I think that's interesting, but that's also, that's also the moment that the, you know, fire nation, uh, patrol, which has been trying to hunt your sister down breaks into the door or into the door from the in room with the innkeeper looking in the background, looking really upset that his room got destroyed and saying, that's her, that's the uncontrolled fights, the firebender. And then the fire nation patrol comes in flames up there ready and says, you know, she's coming with us. And then I go, what do you do? And I put, I put, now we're back into a conversation, but I had the moment, I had the ball, I had the spotlight for a moment. I get to decide whatever I want to have happen there in that moment. I could have his sister accept his forgiveness and be guided and comforted by his, you know, by the player. But then I also throw in that, yeah, this is the moment when the Fire Nation Patrol, who has been tracking down your sister, catches up with you because the innkeeper was mad that she blew up the inn room. Or I could do something completely different. I could have Kaya turn angrily, fire starting to brim around her face and hands and says, you know, you only you only care because I'm ruining your reputation because mom and dad told you to come after me. I'm sick of you. I'm tired of you always treating me like I'm a, a little kid. Well, I'm not a little kid anymore. And then she has another outburst. Flames shoot out into the room. You, the, I say the player takes some fatigue damage or the player takes a condition. The room catches on fire and Kaya goes storming out. Now the room's on fire. Your sister did it. You're a little hurt. What do you do? Do you go after your sister? Do you try to put the fire out? What what is how are you feeling in this moment? That's another way that I could take that six minus. I could go in a completely different direction. It all depends on what I, as a GM in that moment, am feeling is going to best fit the established story, the established gameplay. I'm going to rely on my principles and my agenda to sort of guide that. I want to make the, you know, they, they change a little bit from each PBTA game, but if we go back to the original Apocalypse World principles and Dungeon World principles, it's things like you want to fill the characters' lives with danger and adventure and excitement. I want my players to have to make tough decisions and have to deal with the consequences of their actions. I want the world to make like, you know, it should feel like it makes sense and it should feel like there's a form of internal consistency. So I can use these six minuses where I get the power, which the, again, the game calls it a miss. And that's why I was trying to say like, it's a horrible name to give to the game because, or to the, to the concept, because it's not a miss. Look at how much happened because my character quote missed, right? That my sister in the first scenario, my sister still apologized to me, still accepted my apology. And then the fire nation patrol bust in and maybe we're about to go into some sort of conflict or combat system mode or you know or who knows what's going to happen or alternatively like i said it could have that my character you know that the the npc um loses her temper again and loses all control again the gm's job here is to sort of take that moment and turn it into a another complication a downbeat another twist of the story that sort of takes you on to the next moment and the story giving the heroes more time to sort of show what they're made of to sort of um demonstrate uh their principles and their convictions and ultimately you know yeah un unfortunate pumpkin said it best you know you fail forward so your character missed but the story didn't the story continues to move forward so that is why um, I think calling it just a miss or a failure isn't really the most appropriate, you know, way to describe that sort of thing. Um, all right. So I know I was kind of ranting there for the last half hour. Um, but does that, does that fundamentally make sense? You know, chat, let me see if what I see, see what's going on in chat here. Um, okay. Mr. Korbeck, uh, 
who is Xander Fink for the tips are, are playing hack the planet. Awesome. Cool. But modifying it, that's totally fine and acceptable. Um, see, Ayla says in D20, the interesting outcome is interesting because it happened organically and according to the rules to fudge that would cheapen it and make it not interesting. Um, yes. If in D20, you only roll dice at moments where the outcome directly mattered to the immediate future of the game. But a lot of times that is not the case, um, if that makes any sense. Because in technically in D20, since the rules engine is a simulational physics engine, you need to make checks in D20 even when it's not interesting. That's where it can get kind of kind of mixed up, you know? That's where like it can kind of get twisted around. Uh, Frostcheck says, it's a conflict between what should happen logically versus what would be the most interesting or dramatic thing to happen. 100%, absolutely, absolutely. And, I, I, and by the way, a good story should still feel logic, logical and consistent. When we see a movie and things occur that don't seem logical or consistent, we usually, you know, can jar something inside of our brain and we go, wait a minute, what? That doesn't make any sense. This is bad writing. So, you know, you could still make horrible decisions um, when you're, even though you're trying to make something dramatic or interesting. Um, but, you know, I, I think, a narrative-based game is more concerned with creating interesting outcomes than creating logical ones. But I do think that you should, you know, agree. I think you should try to maintain some degree of, of things making sense. Um, uh, Entheo says, PPTA feels like a style of game for those of us who are more English lit types uh, than math types. You know, that's the other thing too that I, I think needs to get brought up, which is, you know, these games, there, there, there is a mechanical element to these games. There's actually, I don't want to say that there's like a meta game to the game but you know there's definitely a way that you can build your characters to be effective and to do interesting things and be successful in some ways and not successful in others so again i i think that that's uh you know there's still a game here that's ultimately why i like these games it's like i don't want to just sit around and play storyteller time sometimes maybe i do but that's like a microscope or a, a fiasco right there's really no fundamental mechanic of success or failure or consequence or you know who gets the ball next. It's really just sort of a group shared storytelling exercise, really more of an improv theater developer. Um, this is a real game. You know, these games are not rules light. I, I, if anything, I would say that games like this are actually fairly complex, but they are not complicated. Whereas a game like Pathfinder 2 isn't maybe all that complex, D20, add your modifiers versus a DC, right? I mean, that's pretty much most of the game. But it is very complicated. There's a lot of addendums to that that change that, that add this, hundreds of feet, you know, hundreds of feet, thousands of feet, hundreds of spells, you know, all the different mechanics, all the different, all the different conditions, all that stuff serves to complicate what is essentially D20 plus modifier versus DC. That's what the whole game system is. So the game system itself is pretty pretty not that complex but it is very very complicated but a game like this can actually be pretty complex at times um so uh now i should note you know uh one of one of the things that i was talking about before about different stylistic choices um because you know ayla says here yeah i think these games work best when verisimilitude and dramatic out uh, outcomes align that's what potentially interests me about pbta uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I think it is, I think it is best when those things do align because, you know, one of the things that you always want to be, you know, which is always true in a PBTA game, right? Which is, you know, if it's true in the fiction, um, you know, if it's true in the fiction, you know, then it's, then it's true. I know that sounds stupid, but like, Nothing, nothing in the mechanics can trump what is actually being said or done or has been established as happening in the game. In other words, if we've established that your character is, I don't know, able to fly, it doesn't matter if there's some mechanic that describes whether you can fly or not. Your character can fly. 
you know? And so like, that's where it's like, um, you know, very, very, you know, oh, who is this person? Um, da, da, da. We don't need to be screaming in here. Um, anyways, um, the, uh, if it's true in the fiction, then it's true. And that's what I think is important is like, if we've established something, then you shouldn't be just changing it willy nilly just because it's quote cool to change it. No, like that creates, that is definitely violating one of the core principles of, of a player, you know, powered by the apocalypse GM, which is, you know, um, don't necessarily just, uh, change something just because it's it's convenient to do so. But uh, what I was gonna try to say is, it's like some characters or, or some GMs like Ben. Now, Ben isn't a big fan. Ben uh, Asaro from our, our Night's Last Call Patreon. Many of you here know him. Um, he kind of, he doesn't like having that kind of uh, narrative control. He doesn't like having that kind of bias that he can just interject into the game, right? So. The way that Ben, who, again, doesn't play much PBTA, but when he does, what Ben does is he uses the six minus as a platform for an Oracle role, right? Rather than him deciding what happens next and, you know, him not wanting necessarily to interject his own, but I'm fine, and especially in a narrative game of being like, I think this would be cool. I want to see this happen. I want to see the players have to deal with this, right? Or like, you know, you're the GM. You're kind of, you know, in a, in a D20 game, I feel like the GM is a little bit more of like a, a referee or an umpire. But in a PBTA game, I feel like the, you know, uh, the, the GM is a little bit more of a director. Uh, you know, you're looking at the, the game through the lens of, of a movie or an author. And so I'm thinking like, okay, I'm reading the room. I'm reading the the players. Everyone looks a little, you know, there's a little, a little bit of boredom creeping in. It's been kind of quiet. So when that player goes to guide and comfort his sister and gets the six minus, I go, this is a perfect, perfect opportunity for everything being fine until the Fire Nation attacked. And that's when, you know, the Fire Nation, you know, uh, patrol kicks in the door and maybe a, a fight breaks out because it's going to be great from an editing, from a pacing perspective, boom, it's gonna take that you know game up to the next notch. I'm using my ability as a game master to sort of read the room, to sort of take it where I want it to take it. But if you're not comfortable with that, like I said, some people use it in a different way. Ben's solution, which I don't think is actually a bad one, is he doesn't wanna have that kind of, he doesn't wanna have that kind much say over what happens in his game. He wants to be almost entirely procedural. And so when Ben's uh, player's role is six minus, he decides what happens via an Oracle role. And then his job as the game master is sort of interpret that Oracle role into the conversation and, and sort of add in this additional factor or element, depending on, you know, particularly if he's using the uh, GME, uh, the game master emulator, as sort of an, as sort of a way to sort of uh, uh, model what is happening in his in his in his game. Hey, laughing out loud! Welcome, glad to have you here. Um, awesome, awesome. Um, let's see here. GM Scott, just wait for August 2022, then you'll get it right. That's very fast. Ayla says, after playing lots of PF2, it doesn't sound stupid at all, but how often in PF2 does flavor text imply something in the fiction, but the mechanics fail to reinforce in the fiction all the damn time? 100% true. You know, it's very, very true. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's very true. Um, let's see. Um... RPG Music says Dungeon World is the worst application of PBTA, in my opinion, because people want to play it like Fantasy 20, but it is not an actual Fantasy 20. D Dungeon Worlds does suffer that from that problem. And I've seen a lot of people play Dungeon World badly because they treat the mechanics like it's a D20 roll and that it's trying to like simulate the outcome of something. And that is most definitely not. Uh, Ayla said she really enjoys the Ben's approach, and I figured that you would. Um, <laughs> that actually makes sense to me. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, that's, you know, um, uh, you know, you're better with improvising. You like Ben style, but it's outside of your own. Right. And that and you know what? And to each their own. And I think that's where, you know, RPGs are really cool because you can individually sort of, you know, model them to your taste and to your group's tastes. Um, so. Um, 
KC says, I rolled a six minus on the Sunday night activities. Wife took control of the narrative and decided that we were watching Ted Lasso tonight. See y'all at the end or in the VOD. <laughs> KC, take care. Enjoy Ted Lasso. That's pretty good. Um, okay. So now that we've sort of, uh, you know, spent an hour talking about philosophy of mechanics, um, let's get into the basic moves. Let's kind of, kind of, let's take a look and say, what, uh, what does this game even care about? And what are we, what are, what are the mechanics of this game support? Right. Um, so a couple of things here, basic moves are things that all characters are going to be able to do. And we can see here from our, um, basic moves that we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight basic moves. And so the uh, eight basic moves of Avatar are as following. So let, let's break this down. Um, almost all PBTA games have some sort of what I call information gathering move. Some games have two of them or even three of them. Some games only have one, um, but all of them have at least one of these. This is classically referred to as the read a sitch, as in like a situation move, um, because that's what it was originally called in Apocalypse World. In Dungeon World, this move is called discern realities. But um, sometimes the game will sort of establish between is this about people or is this about um, like things or places or situations? I personally feel like having one roll or one and move for this is fine. So basic move assess the situation. It says when you assess the situation, roll with creativity. On a seven to nine, ask one question. On a 10 or higher, ask two. And it says take plus one ongoing when acting on the answers. That means it, plus one ongoing means that if you use those answers to inform your next decisions, then you get a plus one to those rolls. And ongoing means ongoing until basically that, you know, help or that knowledge or that insight no longer applies, that plus one is continuous. And again, this is a game where, you know, uh, the whole, you know, getting a plus one is a big deal. It's only 2d6. You only, you only need a seven or higher to succeed. So this could be very, very, very powerful from mechanically. But the key with this assess the situation is, and I'm going to apply this from like a how people get this wrong in in, in Dungeon World. This isn't I okay. I look around the room. Oh, so you're assessing the situation? No. When you someone looks around the room, you just describe what's in the room. Okay. What a player sees and what a player you know uh, is experiencing or what they are uh, you know observing is not assessing a situation. When a player character describes that their character is trying, again, think about movies. You see this all the time where that character with the camera pauses for a moment and there's like that beat, you know, that, that story beat for a moment where the character pauses, you know, maybe they sigh, they take a deep breath, you know, <sighs> you know, they're looking around, right? So like that is a moment where they are assessing the situation. And of course, whenever, whenever, whenever possible, um, you know, clarify with the player, um, figure out what it is that they're trying to do. And the player might say, oh yeah, I'm trying to assess the situation because here's the deal with assess the situation. And if you're familiar, this is the system that I've been trying to build for Pathfinder two for our, <laughs> for, for battle cry three. Um, <laughs> because I think it's so awesome. <laughs> I think it's so useful because when you assess a situation and you, let's say, get a 10 or higher, you get to ask two of these questions and the GM must answer truthfully, okay? So the key thing here is sometimes this information, right? It, it, we, we kind of work backwards into it. The player, the player, not the PC, the player is asking this question, right? I, the player, want to know who, who, who or what is the biggest threat here? And the game goes, I'm gonna, I have to give you that information. I have to tell you who or what is the biggest threat here. And then I'm telling you that, that as a player. Now, how does your PC know that? How could your pos PC possibly know that? 
That is the challenge. That is the fun of the game. The game mechanics are telling us this is true. Why is that true? Let's make that up. Let's have fun. Let's FBT. Let's role play, right? Let's figure out why that's true. So as an example for this, um, let's say that there's a, you know, I don't, I'm trying to think of a situation here, but it's like, maybe there's a people ambushing on the road. It's actually an ambush. And there's like five mercenaries and they have someone in chains and that they say they're escorting a prisoner. And you wanna know, you, you assess the situation and you ask, what, you know, who's the biggest threat here? And you, as a GM, they've made their, they won, they got their check. So my job is to tell them, hey, you know what the biggest threat is? It's actually the prisoner. She's not a prisoner at all. Actually, this is all just a ruse to, to get people to drop their guard. You realize that she's not even really, you know, she's actually barely bound at all. And you can see the shackle starting to move. She's a metal bender. And she, you know, and you're like, oh, wow, cool. I, I gained all that information. Maybe I noticed it. Maybe my keen senses. Maybe I'm an earthbender and I could feel that she was a powerful earthbender. Why I learned it, that's for us to kind of make up. That's the challenge. That's the role-playing game part of it where we have to figure out why we know this information. Assessing a situation is potentially a way for us to even learn information that our characters might not ever really be able to learn, but our players learn it anyways. So this, is, is, this isn't a PC tool. This is a player tool. This is a way for your characters, for the people playing your game to be, make better and more informed decisions, right? So that's, that's kind of where this assess the situation comes in. Now, the questions that are on this list are, by the way, exhaustive. What that means is this isn't an example of five questions. No, no, no. These are the five questions. Why? Because that's what this game cares about, okay? This game, if, it, if it's not on this list, that is a purposeful exclusion, okay? There is no mechanic in this game to, you know, answer these questions or to answer out something outside of these questions. That means that if a player wants to know something else that's outside of the scope of this, then we just use the normal GM moves, which is a lot of times the GM might just say, I'm gonna tell you the answer because the game doesn't really care about that. No move was triggered. Because remember, we're just having a conversation. The player says, you know, I look around and I'm, you know, trying to, you know, what's going on here? And I go, okay, well, there's nothing here for you to assess. So I'm not gonna make you make this roll. I'm just gonna tell you what's up. I'm gonna tell you what's going on. So yeah, you can't think of this as a perception check, you know? Um, you, 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 you have to think of this as more of like an active thing, right? Like this is the player indicating, hey, I wanna gain additional information. I wanna gain kind of insider information about what's going on in this, you know, um, this moment. Because realize, this is another thing, I've heard people say this before, I've actually heard people complain specifically about this basic move. If you get a six minus, that's the GM's move. That's the ball in the GM's court. And so people say, so are you telling me that because I wanted to look around a room, I have to roll, and that if I roll badly, the GM could make, you know, the room explode, or the GM could make a bunch of Fire Nation soldiers appear. Um, yeah, I, I actually am telling you that. <laughs> but for a moment there, think about that. Number one, number one, it's not whenever you look around the room, it's when your character engages in a moment of assessing the situation, okay? But the other thing you have to think about it is, think about the way that you play into that. Let's say that the group, because again, it's not simulationist people. It's not simulationist. Let's say that the group is making their way through some forest. And I describe things and they're really spooky and there's sort of a weird thing going on. And I don't really know what's going on. I'm just kind of making stuff up. And someone chooses to assess the situation. They describe their character, you know, saying, hold on a second. I've got a bad feeling about this. And then they make the roll with creativity. They're assessing a situation. And then they roll a six minus. And that's when I tell them, 
yeah, you were right. You did have a bad feeling about this as a gigantic snake lion leaps out from the, you know, nearby tree to try to, you know, grab up whatever, you know, Hoshi and pull him away into the, the wild, uh, pull him off into the wild. What do you do? That snake lion got triggered by the move. It might not have been there otherwise. And some people go, oh my God, that is such a problem for me. And that's very fair. And that's very understandable. A couple of things. Ayla says, yikes. Do you think that would discourage people from wanting to roll or use the move? Yes. Yes. And I think that's a good thing, Alia. I think that's a good thing because it means that people just don't fucking throw their dice around whenever. It means that when you make decide to make a dice roll, it's a big deal and people should listen up and they should pay attention because it means that the, there's something is about to happen. Something is about to happen. There is never a dice roll that's going to be like, uh, no, nah, you don't see anything. All right. Wh what does anybody else want to do? That is never going to happen. Think about how many dice rolls occur at your table as a player or as a GM. When you're sitting as a player and you've got your fellow players where you go, oh, I don't need to pay attention to that dice roll. It doesn't really matter, right? Oh, they're making a medicine check. If they fail, they'll just try again. Oh, the, oh, you're recalling knowledge. Okay. Oh, you failed. Oh, it was a critical failure. The, the GM obviously lied to you, right? Like we just pay, don't pay attention to this stuff all the time. You enter a room. Oh, oh I'll look around. I'm, you know, I'll make a perception check. I'll, I'll take a look. Okay. Uh, you don't see anything, you know, you don't see anything. Okay. Oh, Rogue, you noticed that there's a fluttering cart you know tapestry maybe there's a secret door behind it oh, okay cool and everybody else is just spamming die rolls right and getting used to it in fact one of the big problems that a lot of people have when they start playing dungeon world and therefore ppta games is because they're used to just spamming dice rolls in a normal d20 game <laughs> they do that in dungeon world and that means that mathematically they are going to get more of these six minuses and suddenly it can just become like oh my god everything bad is happening why is this game happening like this it's like because you're rolling the dice too damn much <laughs> um and so yeah uh the, the long story short is yes it does discourage people from wanting to roll or use the move it means that every roll matters and could potentially be a pivotal moment in the story and you either like that or you dislike that i personally you know, really like that. Um, let's see here. <sighs> Pumpkin is, is right on the money here. The players shouldn't just be constantly assessing a situation. Or if they are, it's, it's going to, you know, number one, I mean, it's going to lead to a lot of failed roles, which is going to lead to a lot of outcomes. But it's also where as a GM, you have to take a moment and you have to say to yourself, okay, uh, do you understand how what you're doing here and, and how this game is operating and how this game is, is supposed to work? Um, I, I RPG Musings, I, I, I fully agree with this as well. Uh, RPG Musings says, I am a true believer in the style of RPG design and play that says a die should only be rolled if failure is interesting, meaningful, and or dangerous. And I, I, I've definitely espoused that philosophy as well. And I should also add, not to go off on another tangent within a tangent, you know, the core structure that we know of about D&D &D was originally based on an idea that time was a very, very precious commodity. Time meant torches burning low. Time meant water and food running out. Time meant more chances for a random monster or wandering monster or a random encounter to s jump upon your party and kill everybody. Or you know, at least threaten your lives and offer you very little money or treasure in return, which meant almost no experience, even though you were fighting something that could easily kill you. So every minute spent in a dungeon used to be very, very, very precious. And something like searching for secret doors wasn't a two and a half second perception check. It was a 10 or 20 minute affair. Picking a lock wasn't something that was a three action activity. It took minutes of time. And so in that original context of D20, AKA first edition D&D &D and basic D&D, &D, failure, which resulted in quote, nothing, actually was actually time failure. In fact, the way that you would model this, okay, D Dungeon World and, and uh, Powered by the Apocalypse is actually just 
a model of that original basic D and D concept. Um, take care, pumpkin. Enjoy playing Call of Cthulhu. Uh, that's pretty crazy. Um, so what I mean to say is, in original, this is like you know, this is this is like uh, you know, O D and D here, right? So uh, you know, or basic D and D, you know, first edition, first edition, A D and D. Um, let's say I'm going to search a room. Okay. And as a GM, I know that, that is going to take approximately 20 minutes. So I let the players, um, uh, I let the players search the room and then they make a check. Now they are going to roll a die and they are either going to, you know, find the secret door or the secret treasure, you know, we'll say the treasure, um, or they won't, but 20 minutes have passed. So I am also going to roll a die to determine if a random encounter, random encounter happens, right? So we can imagine a world in which our characters spend 20 minutes searching a room. And we could imagine that there's a, a world where they, they find the treasure, yes or no, and they uh, have a random encounter with a monster, yes or no, right? So it kind of creates this grid, right? They could find the treasure and have a random encounter, or they could not find the treasure and not have a random encounter, et cetera, et cetera, right? There's like four possible outcomes. Well, in Powered by the Apocalypse, you would just model this as, as a 10 or higher, you found the treasure, okay, you found the treasure, and there was no encounter. On a six or minus, no treasure, okay, no treasure, and, but, Monsters find you and you have a random encounter. And then on a seven through nine, a mixed beat, you find the treasure, right? And just as the party is pulling that glittering chest out of the secret uh, spot in the wall, then monsters show up maybe to guard, you know, to defend their treasure. So this is taking a simulationist approach and it's actually converting it into a simpler procedural form. Um, and so in that regard, original D and D, um, you know, kind of actually followed this pattern of behavior. The key here is that in original D and D time was an important issue. So, you know, another example, for example, maybe a, a six minus, uh, you know, again, if we're, if we're playing dungeon world, I might say, you know, you spend, you know, the, the, the minutes, turn into, you know, almost an entire hour and you are unable to locate the treasure. No monsters find you, but your torches begin to flicker and go out. What do you do? And everyone's like, okay, I guess we got to light another torch. And by the way, torches used to not be, you know, 10 torches for one light bulk. Torches were a much more valuable commodity that took up a lot more space and were quite more limited. So again, in a dungeon world concept, I could be like, oh, when they roll a six minus, they don't find the treasure, but time passes. Monsters find them. They eat, they become hungry. They need to eat more food. They need to use more torches. That was all true in the original play pattern of D&D. But as we've moved away from that dungeon procedural element of Dungeons and Dragons, but we've kept the same D20 mechanic, I wonder if it's actually, you know, that's part of the problem. Because the, the fact of the matter is, in the old style of D&D, there was no failure, nothing happens. That's actually a new concept because there was something that happened, which is you wasted time and time really mattered. Now, I'd argue, I think you would all agree with me, that for most, pay, most groups and most times and most places, time really doesn't matter. Not to mention that most of these checks take, you know, six seconds or 12 seconds. 
Um, so even if, even if you time did matter, you're like, okay, but that only took six seconds. Searching a room, if you look in the original D and D book, could take anywhere from twenty minutes to to an hour, depending on the size of the room. I mean, if you've ever searched your bedroom for something, uh, and that's your personal bedroom, not a you know scary place where there's monsters that might kill you and traps that might kill you, um, with you know horrible lighting except by a flickering torchlight, you know that it takes more than six seconds to search a room, um, <laughs> let alone a dungeon chamber which might be fifty or sixty feet across and have you know. Uh, you know, mold in the walls and slimes. And again, you know, we have to give it a kind of a, 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 a point of comparison here. So, um, hey, oh, negative. Welcome to the adventure. We've got a new member, everybody. I am strong, strong. Cheers. Strong. Cheers to you, negative 411. Appreciate you. Thank you for becoming a member of the Knights of Last Call Adventuring Squad. Uh, enjoy your loyalty badge and access to your fun, fun, cool emojis. Um, thank you for sponsoring the channel. That's very fair. That's very awesome. Uh, Knox Knox says, yeah, 10 minutes per 10 foot square. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, you know, doing a simple 30 by 30 room could take like 90 minutes, which might be like three random encounter rolls. Like that was a big risk. And to do all that and fail and then be like, you weren't able to find it. No monsters found. And then you hear the GM roll behind the die, you know, behind the screen. Could do, could do, could do, rolling those random encounter checks. And then it's like, okay, you didn't find anything. Do you still want to keep searching? And it's like, oh, wow, okay, this is actually feels like this is kind of an interesting game mechanic going on here because it does feel tension filled and it does feel kind of scary. So that's, again, I think where that can really make a difference. Um, okay. So again, assess the situation. All Powered by the Apocalypse games have these. We are going to focus on um, plead. We're going to kind of skip around here a little bit. We're going to do these two last, but we're going to do plead, intimidate, and trick next. And what do these all essentially, this is, and by the way, this is the game telling us what it wants the, us to, you know, this game to be about. This game is giving us three ways, okay, to interact with our NPCs. Um, <laughs> negative, I watched too much not to join. Well, I appreciate it, Negative. Thank you so much for that. That appreciate the support. Um, this is giving us three different ways that we can, you know, have mechanical effects for dealing with our uh npc interactions and more importantly we know that there are um you know if we look at our character sheets here real quick there are four stats in this game creativity focus harmony and passion okay if we look so that's it you know you don't have six stats in avatar you have four stats so those are the four things that we're going to be rolling creativity focus harmony passion and if we look each of these three moves, pleading, intimidating, and tricking, all rely on a different stat. Plead relies on our harmony stat. Intimidate relies on our passion stat. And trickery relies on our creativity stat. This is a great way, mechanically, to make sure that everyone can basically do something in terms of a mechanical social interaction with an npc now to be clear just because your character has a really high creativity doesn't mean that you must trick them every time in fact you know the differences between your good stat and your bad stat in power by the apocalypse might be a plus two versus a plus zero so you still have a really good chance of succeeding even if it's not quote unquote the thing that you're best at and more importantly these all have different outcomes plead intimidate trick Number one, you have to be doing that in the fiction. I mean, if you're not tricking someone, it doesn't, that this move will never trigger. So you're not actually going to get the benefits of it. But you might be really good at creativity, but you don't want these outcomes. This is telling you that if you succeed at a trickery role, this as a player is what you're going to be able to sort of force the game to do. But you don't want these outcomes you want one of these outcomes. If you want one of those outcomes, you are going to have to 
intimidate. Correct, Alia. Correct, Alia. You cannot just say, I rolled a trick. That's exactly right. Because technically, and I'm being very pedantic here, but I think it is an important point. Moves trigger off of what is being said or done in the fiction. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with a player saying, you know, especially if they're new to the game, oh, boy, I really want to trick this NPC. And they mean like the move. I want to trick an NPC. And I would say, awesome, great. What does that look like? How do you do that? Right? How do you want to do this? What does that look like? Um, and you're like, oh, uh, the player's like, what? I'm like, what do you say or what do you do? What a what is the method? What if we looked at this in the fiction? If we looked at this in a in the script of the movie, if this was a TV show and we saw this on screen, what is your character doing that is going to trick this NPC? Um, and they go, oh, okay, um, yeah, I I'm gonna uh, go up to them and you know, again, this is game is trying to emulate Avatar. You know, sometimes they might dress in a silly costume or pretend to be somebody they're not. Right? There's a lot of you know, kind of silly moments sometimes in the in the in the Avatar show, but the long and the short of it is yes, you don't just say I roll to trick. I think it's okay if a player announces to the table to the GM, I really want to trick this person. But that's fine. We can have that sort of out of character conversation. But what's important is that you always ground it in the conversation, that you always ground it in the fiction, and that you're having those, you know, those conversations to make it so that it actually is something that we can point to and say, oh, okay, that's how they got tricked. Um, because also too, fictional truths are fictional truths. If your character says, oh, I'm gonna go dress up as a Fire Nation person and uh, I'm gonna go tell them, uh, you know, uh, oh, I'm I'm taking over your guard shift for the next hour. You, you won a prize, uh, uh, go, you know, go claim it, um, fine. But now we've established certain elements in the fiction, right, which is, I'm dressed up like a Fire Nation person. That's true now. Whether I succeed or whether I fail at this role, I'm dressed up as a Fire Nation person, right? So that's kind of where, you know, the fictional reality that that verisimilitude always holds true. But again, this move is saying very discreetly, this is what tricking an NPC does. And if you're good at creativity, you'll be good at this. And if you're good at being passionate, you'll be good at intimidating. And if you're good at uh, harmony, you'll be good with pleading with an NPC. But again, this is a game and we play it. Sometimes as a player, you're gonna say, well, I really wanna get the benefits of the plead action. I want the mechanical benefits of plead. So I'm gonna have to plead with this NPC, which means two things. So number one, I'm gonna be rolling harmony even if harmony is not my quote, best stat, my best stat might be passion, but I'm not, I don't want these results. I want these results. So I'm gonna have to roll with harmony. And number two, it means that in our fiction, in our conversation, I'm gonna actually have to, you know, plead with an NPC who cares what you think for help, support, or action. And we get it, we have to, we must describe that. Right. And that doesn't mean we have to act it out like in, you know, literal, you know, dialogue and, you know, full FBT. Um, but it, it does mean that at least we need to have a moment in our game where someone's actually describing what they're saying or what they're doing or how they're going about it or what it looks like or, you know, any of the things that are happening in this moment. We just really want to avoid. Uh, yeah, I'm going to roll plead. Cool. I got an eight. So. Uh, I'm going to choose, uh, you know, that it's like, no, 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 <laughs> we have to do better than that. We must do better than that. And, and, you know, some, uh, PBTA games are very strict about this and they say, you know, you can't do these things. Um, uh, you can, you can never speak the name of your action. It can only trigger, but let's take a look. So we have three of these, which means that social, okay. Social interaction is a big part of the avatar game. It's giving, I mean, there's only there's only what eight basic moves right one two three four five six seven eight and three of them are social plead intimidate and trick they have to deal with interacting with npcs so this lets us know that social interaction is a big big part uh, of the game 
So let's take a look at these. So when you plead with an NPC who cares what you think for help, support, or action, roll with harmony. Now, again, I'm, I know I'm, I feel like I'm beating a dead horse here. This is important because, you know, people do this as kind of a joke in D20, but like in D20, in Pathfinder 2, right, you come up to somebody, they're unfriendly to you. They might even be hostile to you, right? They're neutral, you know, and you come up to them and you go, you know, we always joke when we do this, but you know, it's like diplomacy, you know, it's like, um, like it's like some sort of magical ability, you know, you're like make impression, you know, and you're like, uh, uh, they're, they're, they're forced into being friendly. Right. Um, and you're like, okay. And they're like, request, give me what I'm asking for. They're like, ah, oh, you passed my will DC. I have no choice. Here you go. Diplomacy doesn't have this. Now, of course, in real in, in real life, we all know that that's not how that should work. And we also, I think, fundamentally understand that that's not how the game should work either. But the rules certainly suggest that it is. Uh, and it's kind of weird to be in that position where you go, no, 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 this person's immune to your diplomacy. And you're like, why? I'm really good at diplomacy. Isn't that why I'm really good at diplomacy? Shouldn't I be able to just go up to this guard and get them to give us, I don't know, money or a sword or the keys to the thing. Isn't that what this whole check is about? To a certain extent, that might even be right. But here's the key. This is if you plead with an NPC who cares what you think. So if you and I are having a conversation and I'm the GM and you're the PC and you start kind of pleading with this person for help or support, and you start going to reach for your dice because you're about to make a plead with an NPC check, I might go, oh, and, and by the way, very honest transparency, I might go, oh, no, 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 sorry, no check. And you're like, why? I'm like, well, the plead move didn't trigger. Well, why? I'm pleading with them. Yeah, but they don't care what you think. You're nobody to them. They don't even know who you are. Why would they care? You can't plead with them. In order for this move to trigger, in our game, the NPC has to care what you think and they don't know you or maybe they do know you and they just don't care what you think. So pleading with them isn't going to do anything. Sorry, no dice. So that's sort of like where the the fictional, uh, you know, the fictional component um, really matters because as a GM and as a player, we all have to have that open conversation. And it's like, okay, this person is kind of immune to being pleaded with me. So these are the subtle differences. And like in Dungeon World, there is a move called Parlay, which is very similar to Diplomacy from you know your standard D20 game. But Parlay has this really important clause in there, which says the player has to have some kind of leverage on the person they are parlaying with in order to try to get them to do something. That leverage could be, you know, blackmail, but the leverage could also be, well, they're my best friend. They're my sister. Don't you care about me? I'm going to use that leverage in order to try to get them to help us, right? So Dungeon World puts in this additional caveat with parlay that this person, you have to have something on them. In Avatar, they specifically call this out and say it's not just leverage of any type. It's they have to care what you think. If an NPC does not care what you think, they essentially are immune to this action. Now, that doesn't mean that you and the player, the GM, can't just have an open conversation. And you will. It'll be a back and forth, and the GM will use their GM moves to decide how the NPC acts. But you, the player, will not be able to trigger the mechanical benefits of the plead action unless all of these things are true. But let's say we are talking with an NPC and they do care what we think and we're asking them for help, support, or action, right? Well, then we're going to roll with our harmony stat. And if we get a seven to nine, they need something more. Evidence that this is the right course, guidance in making the right choices, or resources to aid them before they act. The GM will tell you what they need. This is basically the equivalent of the GM saying, this is the fetch quest. Uh, hey, Mighty Dave, enjoy uh, walking with your dog. I'm going to be taking my dogs for a walk after this stream as well. Uh, check out the VOD. 
So again, this is a great, this is just a, a fun way for the GM to make the game. Uh, like it's, it's, it's that, it's that next little hurdle, right? If you ever watched, you know, an Avengers, you know, in a Marvel movie, it's like, oh, we, we figured out how to do the thing. We just need to get the thing first. We need to get the, the next thing. And the next thing is going to send us on the next part of our journey and the next part of our adventure and the next part of our quest. So it's like, you know, you go to your, you know, your, your best friend is now the, the sheriff of the town and you go to them and you say, listen, you need to arrest, you know, the, the, the merchant, you know, the mayor, the mayor is corrupt. The mayor is secretly working with the fire nation. You have to arrest them and you roll a seven to a nine. And the, the, the NPC goes, listen, I have my suspicions about the mayor too, but I swore an oath to defend the law and the law matters what was what matters the most to me. I'm going to need some kind of hard evidence that I can use in order to carry out this arrest. If you could find me proof that the mayor is secretly aiding the fire nation, then I will do what you've asked, which is arrest the mayor. Right. And it's like, okay, so now the players kind of have their marching orders. They go, okay, so if we can figure out evidence, if we can catch them red handed, if we can find some sort of document or something or being paid in fire nation coins or something, right. We've set up the next step. And again, this is all happening spontaneously. So yes, this is going to challenge you and your players. By the way, not a, too many GMs put this on their own self. Sometimes it's fine to ask the players. Like you could go to the players and it's like, she's like, you could tell she wants to help you, but she's going to need something more. Um, anybody have any suggestions? Like what would she need? You, you all have interacted with this NPC a bunch. You might have a feeling for how she would react. Um, what do you think she needs? You know? So again, um, that's the kind of, uh, of thing that you do. On the other hand, if you get a 10 or higher again, right? At moves are a way for the players to kind of steal control of the story. So if you get a 10 or higher on your role, guess what? They're going to act now and they're going to do their best until the situation changes meaningfully. If you get that 10 or higher, the, the sheriff of the town, she's going to look at you and say, you know what? You, you, you know, you're right. I've always had my suspicions, but I've, I've been afraid to act and let's, Let's this this town needs strong leadership and this mayor needs to go and they're going to go help you arrest the, the the mayor. And it's like, oh, wow, cool. You know, we we kind of exerted our our narrative control on the story. But again, we still want it to make sense. We still want it to be logically consistent. So, again, plead uh, is is kind of like NPC mind control. Plead is basically kind of like diplomacy from Pathfinder 2. But the difference is they need to care what you think. You can't just use it on anybody. Um, and secondly, if you get uh, a seven to nine, then the GM is going to give you kind of uh, the 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 MacGuffin, right? What's the next? What do you? You got to do this first. If you do this, then I'll do this. Um, but if you get the ten or higher, you get everything you ever wanted. Um, but of course, like with anything in this game, you could get a six minus when you go to the sheriff, right? So you go to the sheriff, you plead with the NPC, you roll a six minus. As the GM, the ball's in my court now. Now I have my agendas, I have my principles that I should follow. I have my, you know, my goals and my motivations and I want my game to feel internally consistent. So it might not make sense that the sheriff just arrests, I don't know, that she just kills you or something or attacks you because she's your friend. But instead she looks at you gravely and says, you know, um, I don't know how to tell you this, but you know, my daughter is sick and I'm aware that the, the mayor is taking money from the fire nation, but she, you know, that fire nation money also includes fire nation medicine. And it's, what's keeping my daughter alive. And I'm sorry, I cannot risk that. I'm going to have to arrest you and put you in jail until after the election or whatever, until after the referendum. And you're like, Oh shit. Like dun, dun, dun. It's like this next big moment of revelation, right? Um, and it's like the sheriff is still acting consistently. They're giving the reason for their motivation. The players get understand what's happening, but now they're in jail and the sheriff is not probably going to help them. Um, and now they have to think of the next way out. Right. And they certainly didn't get what they wanted. And they are certainly in the next, you know, from out of the, you know, the frying pan into the, into the fire. So that is kind of where a six minus can take them. But again, the idea is it's always pushing the story into an interesting place and pushing it forward. All right. 
So our next social action is intimidate. So when you intimidate an NPC into backing off or giving in, roll with passion. So again, it's the player's responsibility, it's the GM's responsibility. We're having a conversation back and forth. You're saying things in character, I'm saying things in character. You're describing what your PC is doing, I'm describing the actions of the NPCs of the world around you. If at some point in our conversation, our natural dialogue, we realize that you're trying to intimidate an NPC into backing off or giving in, it is our responsibility that someone at the table recognizes, hold up, wait a second, the game cares about this, let's go to the move, let's roll with passion and find out what happens at this moment. So again, maybe going back to the sheriff situation, maybe that plays out a little bit differently. Well, depending on how you play it and depending on how the, the pace of things turn out, maybe you are intimidating the sheriff and you want them to give in. And so you roll the dice. And on a hit, they choose one. So meaning the NPC gets to choose one, right? So you come in, you know, threatening the sheriff with, ex you know, exposing this whole town as being corrupt. And if they don't help you arrest uh, the mayor, you know, you don't want to know the consequences. And you roll with passion and you get a seven or an eight. Well, then I, as the GM, get to look at this list of four options, and I get to choose what this sheriff is going to do. Um, I could choose. All of these options are fine, and I'm not fudging here. I'm following the rules of the game, but the game gives me some leeway here, and I get to pick. They could just choose to attack you, by the way, but maybe that's not consistent with the character. That doesn't mean I'm always going to pick that. As a GM, I'm probably going to pick the one that makes is a combination, going back to what Ailey was saying, uh, of what's interesting and what makes sense. This is your friend. She's not going to, uh, you know, maybe attack you. Um, at, but maybe she says, I can't get involved. There's too much at stake here. I won't help you, but I won't get in your way either. So she's going to, you know, back down and keep watch. That's what you get for, you know, her doing that. On a 10 or higher, though, it's the same thing, but you get to pick one of the options that they can't choose. So, you know, you get to kind of eliminate some of the choices that they get to choose from. So if you were really worried that you're going to intimidate someone and that they were going to attack you, um, when, if you got a tenor hire, you could say, okay, they can't choose that one. They can run away. They can give in or back down, but they can't just, they cannot choose attack you again. It's literally the player, right? Especially with a 10 plus the ball is in their court. They, the spotlight is on them. The player is asserting that narrative control. They get to tell the table how that NPC can't react. They say they cannot choose that one. They will not do that one. And again, it's not literally their PC that is doing it. It's this kind of, you know, player meta construct of the mechanics. So that's intimidate. And then lastly, we have trick, which uses the creativity. So again, if we're trying to trick an NPC, we roll with creativity. If, if we're doing something, we're trying to pull a fast one on an NPC, someone should say, hey, wait, wait, we're trying to trick this NPC. We should be rolling with creativity. If we roll a hit, that's a seven or nine, they fall for it and they do what we want for the moment. On a seven to nine, you get to pick one and on a 10 or higher, you get to pick two of these. So they might stumble and you get to take a plus one forward against them which means you get plus one to your next action against them. They act foolish. The GM tells you what additional opportunity they give you, or they overcommit and they are deceived for some time. So again, you, the PC, get to pick one or two of these options for that NPC. You, because you rolled, because we reached that moment of indecision and you made a roll, you get to decide kind of how this NPC acts, not the GM. And part of the fun of the role-playing game is now it is my job as the GM to be like, okay, I know how this NPC is going to act now. It's not what I would have picked, but it's what you got to pick as a player. You got to own this story for a moment, and now we get to have fun with this and go back to our conversation back and forth, but with these additional restrictions or these additional caveats. So again, these are our three primary social means of interacting with um, uh, NPCs in a game of Avatar. So we've got assess situation to gain information. We've got plead, intimidate, and trick for dealing with 
um, NPCs. So I do want to talk here really quick about guide and comfort because this can be used against a PC, NPC or a PC. So again, some of these moves are designed to emulate a episode of Avatar or uh, you know Legend of Korra or Avatar The Last Airbender. And a big part of the sort of, um, you know, a big part of these shows, <laughs> a big part of these shows when you watch Avatar is this like, is this cycle, right? Which is this idea that like, okay, so you have your PCs and there's, you know, there's some situation that they need to deal with. And, and so the PCs try to deal with the situation, but along the way, there's like a sort of an unforeseen issue that they have to deal with along the way. And this might, you know, result in some sort of, you know, action-y type consequence. Uh, it could be a combat or a chase or something, you know, dramatic and exciting. But that action usually leads to fallout. Usually, and I, I'm going to say emotional fallout. People in the Avatar verse very rarely get physically hurt, but they get emotionally hurt all the time because, you know, these situations that we're creating typically are things that tie very closely to what the players care about. You know, one of the goals of an avatar game is to test these characters, their principles. What do they care about? What are they willing to sacrifice in order to, you know, what, what principles are they willing to bend? What principles are they willing to break in order to achieve success? What's more important to them, success or their principles? And how do you balance all of that? And if we look over at the uh, character sheet, for um, uh, Avatar, we can see that the primary way that you sort of, I would say, take damage is through these conditions, okay? Um, and there's five of them. In fact, if your character has all five conditions marked and then would take a, a, a sixth condition, they are taken out now. What that means actually is kind of up to the player. Could mean that your character dies. Maybe that is, if you think that's a cool moment for your character to die, then maybe that's the appropriate moment. But if it doesn't make sense, if, if it's not something that would even kill your character, or if you decide, I don't, I like my character and I want to keep playing them, then, then you get to decide, you know, we, they're not dead, but like they're taken prisoner. They, you know, their spirit is trapped in the spirit world and they're comatose, right? We, we come up with something that sort of, you know, highlights that your character is in, in, in bad and rough shape. But we get these conditions um, on our character sheet and we can see that they have a mechanical effect. You know, it's not too unlike Pathfinder 2. If our character is afraid, well, then they get a penalty to try to intimidate someone as well as to call someone out. We haven't gotten to those moves. Um, if, you know, if someone is insecure, they're not really sure of themselves. They get a penalty to tricking somebody. Makes sense, right? How are you going to, you know, you can't really con somebody if you're, you're not, you know, very confident and secure in yourself. So these things do have mechanical consequences. But they are also designed to be a way as a challenge to the player of how do you deal with these consequences? Like if my character has the angry condition marked, then sure, I get a minus two penalty to guide and comfort and to assessing situations, right? I'm not really good at making people feel good about themselves if I'm pissed off. And it's kind of hard for me to notice, you know, what's going on when I'm, you know, seeing red. But it also means that it's a great, you know, motivation and cue for me as a player to play my character as if they were angry. They are upset. They are, uh, and that should that should flavor my character's actions. So as much as this is a mechanical thing, it is also a role playing thing, and this could be a huge change of pace for people. We we play Pathfinder two all the time, and your character might get hit by a fear spell or a demoralize effect, and you say, "Yeah, I'm frightened one," or "I'm frightened two," and then you just go, "Okay." It's a minus two penalty to my attack rolls. All right, I am going to uh, raise my shield, stride, and I am going to attack this person. And you being frightened didn't 
change or anything. There's no, I, I would argue it's probably pretty rare that you have somebody who plays Pathfinder 2 who receives the frightened condition and actually plays as frightened. Furthermore, to be completely fair, if you become frightened 2 or frightened 3 in Pathfinder 2, well, your frightened condition drops by one every six seconds. So within six seconds or 12 seconds or 18 seconds, your character will no longer be frightened. That's not the way conditions work in Powered by the Apocalypse. They're not the way conditions work in the Avatar Legend game. If your character becomes angry, they stay angry until something happens that lets you remove the angry condition, right? So you're angry and your character's gonna stay angry until they deal with that anger, right? That could fester inside of them. They could be in a real bad mood until they have a way to sort of resolve it. And that gets back to these whiteboards here where again, you're gonna have a situation where the PCs are trying to deal with the situation and then there is some sort of unforeseen issue that makes it, you know, a challenge. That's what makes the game interesting because it's like, oh, you know, we need a, uh, we need heroes to be, to be, uh, <laughs> we need heroes in order to uh, save the day. So there's this unforeseen, uh, there's unforeseen issue. And then while dealing with that issue, it creates emotional fallout, right? So we come into the town and my characters from the Earth Kingdom, and then they see that, you know, Kuvira is starting to, um, you know, take over the town. And maybe because of part of the consequences of that first action scene, my character becomes angry because they're angry at what, you know, she's doing. She's he's, They're angry that that nobody has stopped her. They're angry that like, they've just let Kuvira walk all over the Earth Kingdom and turn it into the Earth Empire, right? Like now, not only is my character gonna be at minus two to guide and comfort and assess the situation, but I am playing my character like they are angry. And that's a kind of a big part of Avatar because when you're angry, it can make it more difficult for you to deal with things and you know other issues come out. And so that is what brings us to guide and comfort. Guide and comfort is kind of like the the treat wounds, <laughs> right? Of 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 Avatar. Guiding and comforting is the main way that you can heal your fellow PCs, or potentially even your um, uh, what's the word I'm saying here? You can heal uh your fellow PCs, or you can heal an NPC if the situation makes sense. So when going way the back. So when someone tries to guide, when honestly guide and comfort another person. So if in the narrative, if in the description, you're not being honest, you're not being, like if you go to someone and you try to comfort them with words of, you know, belief and truth, but you're not honest, you're not being honest about it, this move won't trigger, right? It, it's gotta be from the heart because that's what Avatar is all about we're gonna roll with our harmony stat. And if we get a seven or higher, okay, the person that we are trying to guide and comfort always gets to make a decision. They could choose to embrace our comfort. And if they do that, they get to clear a condition or to fatigue. We haven't really talked about fatigue, but don't worry about it too much. But fatigue is more of a, more has to do with some of like your, your bending and your, some of your moves and powers. Um, but, there's a catch. Now you might say, oh, by the way, the other option is they can shut you down. They can, they, I, I'm angry. My, my PC is angry. And let's say Darth Gorlock is playing my buddy. You know, we grew up together and he comes over and he tries to guide and comfort me. And he tries to talk to me about it. And he makes his role and he gets an, a, a, an eight or a nine. So he's successful. I get to pick, Derek gets to pick. Do I embrace their comfort? or I could shut down Darth Gorlock's PC. Why would I ever shut down Darth Gorlock's PC? Well, number one, because this isn't D&D. &D. We're not trying to win. <laughs> if, if that is what I think is internally true to my character, then that is the right decision for me to make. Secondly, because if I accept their comfort and guidance, I will be able to clear the angry condition. But Darth Gorlock then has then may ask me a question and I must, Derek must answer it honestly. 
That means that Darth Gorlock can basically get out of me a statement which I must play as being true. So if my PC was like, um, you know, I am I am committed to, uh, you know, destroying the Fire Nation presence in this town. Darth Gorlock could aid and comfort me. I accept their aid. And then Darth Gorlock could ask me a question. They could say, Derek, how is how could I get you to give up your hatred of the Fire Nation? And then I, as Derek, I have to answer that question honestly. And by what I mean by honestly is, if I say, I mean, to be fair, the answer might be never. There's no way for me to ever give up on my attack on the Fire Nation. But I could say something like, if, you know, if, you know, this is a moment for me of growth. It's like, if I could meet you know, uh, if I could, if I could be shown that the fire nation does good and not just evil, then I think that would really change my character's outlook. It would really change the way that I perceive the fire nation. And I think it would change my whole outlook on their, their entire thing. And it's like, okay, great. I have now stated this, this truth in the world. And that if, then if that happens at some point in the future, I'm sort of honor bound to be like, yeah, I got to play with this. Like I spoke that honestly and truthfully from the heart. And unless the situation changes, you know, completely horribly, like, oh, the Fire Nation then goes and kills my whole family. Um, I I'm sort of like, yep, I, I have to abide by that. And you might not want to put yourself in that situation, either as a player or as a PC. Additionally, I talked before about how um, it's kind of a metagame element to this. Uh, sometimes. You're not you're not comp you're not competitive with your fellow PCs, but you do have agendas and you are trying to influence your fellow. You know, we all do this in real life. We're trying to influence our friends. I want to influence my fellow PCs. I want to shift their balance. This is a sort of an element of the game, which we didn't cut to tonight. If I shut down Darth Gorlock, I get to shift their balance. That means I kind of get to push him in the direction that I want him to go. So yeah, Darth Gorlock is kind of taking a, a big risk when he makes this check against me because I could kind of screw him over and I could say, I'm going to put a condition on you and shift your balance. So again, it literally is a, a, a sign of trust. When you open yourself up to guide and comfort somebody, they, they could hurt you in return. Um, and then if I, if I, when I make the roll, I get a 10 plus, they still get to make their choice. But now if they embrace my my if they embrace my healing, I get to shift their balance, um, which means I'm getting to sort of shape their personality. Yes, other PCs at the table are going to be able to shape how your character plays. And I don't just mean that from like a role playing fluffy bullshit time. I mean, mechanically, your character in a game of Avatar has this concept called your balance track, okay? We look at this playbook here. This is the um, adamant, um, okay? The adamant's character is torn between two principles, which is restraint and results. The adamant is extremely powerful. They're, they're, they are a cannon. They are a shotgun, right? They get shit done. And you know what? Kind of damn the consequences. That's results. But they also understand that that creates a lot of collateral damage. That creates a lot of problem. It creates a lot of blowback. It creates a lot of broken pieces. That's the restraint part of it. And sometimes this character is going to be finding themselves pushed and pulled between restraint and results. They're going to want maybe to be restrained. They're going to want to show that they're growing, that they have this ability, but then they realize they're not getting anything done. And the things that they care about and the people that they said that they were going to defend aren't being taken care of. And they have this moment, this panic, this crisis, and boom, now suddenly they're shifting back towards results. Now you have an adamant character who's all the way over to the right side of their results track. They're, they're at a plus three results. And then something happens where they have an option to finally 
destroy the Fire Nation presence in this town. And they do with a tremendous earthquake that, I don't know, maybe collapses a building or a school and a bunch of kids get hurt or even killed. They've been shown the consequences of not having restraint. Sure, they got results, but at what cost? So this is always that push back and forth between these character things. The guide and comfort move that we were just looking at allows your fellow PCs, okay, to push your character up and down this track that allows your character to push your character or allows your um, another PC to push you towards results or towards restraint. They are essentially not only shifting your character mechanically, they're shifting your character from a role-playing perspective as well. So this is, you know, this is when I say PBTA games are like, a true role-playing game, um, kind of what I mean. So guiding and comforting to me is kind of one of the core elements of this game because a lot of this play cycle that we were talking about earlier is going to be this cycle of the PCs are trying to deal with the situation. There's an unforeseen issue. They take some actions. There's some emotional fallout. And then the PCs have to you know, they have to deal with that. They have to deal with that emotional fallout. And then they can go back and try to deal with the issue. And then eventually, after they defeat enough of the unforeseen issues, maybe there's one or two, you know, oh, there's a there's a plot twist. There's actually a second issue. Eventually, you reach some sort of, uh, you know, conclusion and you deal with the situation entirely. But this pattern of action, emotional fallout, deal with the emotional fallout, try to deal with kind of, you know, regroup, deal with the emotional issue or deal with the unforeseen issue again, potentially have emotional fallout, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That cycle of play is a big part of, I think what, uh, for me, um, the avatar game engine is all about. Um, so that's guiding and comforting by the way, I, our deep dives, uh, you know, our legend of the five rings dive deep dive, I think was three, uh, live stream so it was like 10 hours long or something crazy or like eight hours long so don't if if, if we don't give we don't finish everything today don't don't be surprised is all i'm trying to say um we had a question here oh uh, actually we had a bunch of good stuff here i'm sorry i missed some good chat here uh alias says the ppta game attacks immediately and fights to death that is hilarious um dar says playing with conditions was very fun in our first session for the community game today really puts weight behind what does your character feel about it absolutely you know, I also think that, you know, conditions are something that the game mechanically enforces sometimes. But also remember, if it's true in the fiction, it should be true in the game. If, you know, and again, we're not trying to win the game here. We're trying to create interesting narrative experiences. If I decide, you know what? Nothing mechanically forced my character in this moment to be angry or afraid. But if I decide, you know what? I, I feel angry. I feel afraid and it makes logical and consistent sense that my character is angry. Then you should check the box, you know, or, or the GM should say, yeah, all right, check the box. You're actually pretty angry um, because that makes sense. Again, if it makes sense, then the mechanics should reflect that. And I always appreciate, you know, I've always appreciated that about the game. Um, okay. Where were we? Uh, da, 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 da. Ayla says, I, oh, I hate that PF2 calls it frightened and not rattled or shaken. Uh, RPG Music says, the conditions are one of the many things I like about Mouse Guard too. Mouse Guard is very similar, RPG Music, you're correct. Similar things. Torchbearer does the same thing. Yes, I, I'm a huge fan of that. Huge fan of that. Um, da, da, da. um, uh, Ayla says, it's, it makes sense. That emotional conditions don't just go away for no reason. If you are afraid, you should only stop being, uh, 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 I think, afraid. If something changes that makes them not angry. Okay. If you are angry, you should only stop being angry if something changes them that makes them not angry. Uh, Darth says the conditions, fatigue, and guiding and comforting also does me enforce mechanically that there are these downtimes or short moments to catch your breath, just like in Atla or uh, 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 Legend of Korra. And and that's that that's that kind of pattern of play that I was talking about, right? You kind of get, okay, we're, we're learning about what's happening. Then there's a big, you know, exciting action scene that, you know, uh, you know, maybe involves us 
doing cool bending and having lots of stuff happen mechanically. It's very, you know, high, you know, and then we have the, a softer scene, a quieter scene where we sort of deal right with the emotional consequences of what happened. We, we talk to one another, we learn about one another. And then, you know, when we sort of double down or, or reaffirm our beliefs, then boom, that's when the next scene sort of starts up. So it's really cool. Um, Uh, negative says the entire way this game plays out is very different from what I'm used to. It's all part of the appeal. Absolutely. It is different. And I think the key is you need to embrace that difference. You can't fight against it. it it's different and it's different for a reason. And so instead of trying to make it into your standard boilerplate D20 game, the key is to embrace what it is trying to do. But it's also important to understand what it is trying to do. Casey is back for the final push. Welcome back, Casey. Alia says... This isn't D20, but are concepts like party dynamics important here? I suppose I mean, why would you want to debuff your own party members? Or should they not be thought of as party members? Well, you are a companion and you are a crew. But I guess the answer, uh, Ayla, uh, Ayla, is you need to be internally consistent to what is true in the narrative. If this is a moment where your character would lash out at somebody who is trying to help them, and, you know, you shout back at them, uh, you know, I, I, we, I wouldn't be angry if it wasn't for you, you and your pacifistic ways. You always put the, the, sh the shoulder of blame on all of us. That's the reason why we keep failing. And that's why I'm so pissed off. And then like, we all kind of nod our heads and agree. I just gave you the guilty condition. We do that because it's fun. We do that because it's interesting. We do that because it pushes the game forward, because it feels right. And because we're not obsessed with, well, the next encounter is CR balance. There is no CR balance here. There is no combat balance system. There's nothing for you to fuck up by doing it. Instead, you get to play your character truthfully and honestly, and that is gonna lead to the outcomes that I think feel, feel more real. Because instead of just doing what, you know, makes sense because that way you're, you know, SEAL Team 6 squad of D&D &D characters um, can beat the next encounter, you're going to do what feels, you know, logically consistent and correct in that situation. Um, negative says, it really is like an episode of Avatar. Yes, <laughs> it really is. And because, I mean, I mean, obviously I just made that up, but doesn't that sound like something that somebody would have said, you know, like maybe they said it to Aang, right? Like there was a moment Aang could have dealt with the Fire Nation people, but he didn't do it because it might, it might've hurt them. And he's a pacifist and now he feels kind of sad and guilty and he goes off on his own. And then there's a scene where Katara goes and talks to him and they have a quiet moment and she tries to make him realize these things, right? It's all about these sort of character growth moments, these sort of arcs. It's about dealing with the realities of a messy situation, a real world with you know, nuances of shades of gray, but then your character has these principles and they have these beliefs. How do you balance all of that? And we don't know. The answer is it doesn't really matter. What's fun is that we all get to sit around and we get to share in these experiences and these moves together and sort of see the emerging story as it unfolds. And that's what makes it so interesting. Uh, by the way, it's nine o'clock. So I know that some people probably have to go. I am going to go longer because I do want to get through all of the basic moves tonight. Um, we're probably going to do a second stream where we are going to talk about the balance moves, which are also very, very important to this game. Uh, and then we might do like a third stream, if need be, about these playbooks. But um, I do want to get through all of these tonight. So um, let's see here. Uh, Frostjack says, I didn't realize it said center in the middle. I was trying to figure out what the T are. You know what, Frostjack, don't feel bad. I didn't realize that it said center when I first got this either. So I, I am right there with you. Um, so Darth Gorlock said something very similar to me. He says, uh, uh, Ayla, everyone is moving towards a better story. Sometimes it's more interesting to shut down or call out your party members. Like in Atla, you can see them shut down other people all the time. Uh, but they're obviously still friends in the end. Yeah, exactly. All right, Ayla says, okay, I'll be the one to ask. I'd love to see how the elemental bending works. This is Avatar after all. I do want to blow stuff up. So this is probably either the most satisfying or the most unsatisfying thing for you. For starters, 
Let me just say that what they did with this RPG is very different than any other Powered by the Apocalypse game that I have seen, which is traditionally Powered by the Apocalypse games do not have any concept of the combat round or the initiative. Nothing changes. The whole game is just a conversation. Whether we're in an inn having tea or we're fighting, you know, uh, six members of the, you know, the triple threat triad in the streets of Republic City. It's all just a conversation. You say something, I say something, you say something, I say something, you say something that sounds like it might trigger a move. We look it up or we already know it. We do know we roll dice. We see what happens, who gets to make the, you know, who gets to make reality, the player or the GM that happens. And then we continue the conversation. It doesn't matter whether you're in a combat or not. There's no initiative order or anything. That being said, Avatar Legends is the first game that really introduced the concept of what they call the combat exchange. And this is about as close, here we go, this is the exchange step summary. This is about as close to a combat round as you are ever going to see, I think, <laughs> in a Powered by the Apocalypse game. To that end, um, this is where a lot of like the bending techniques come in. This is probably the most crunchy pathfindery two part of avatar. And I've seen a lot of people who really like power by the apocalypse, not like this system because it does feel a bit crunchy and out of place because, and this is why I wanted to answer this question kind of roundabout to answer your question. When you make a character in avatar, you are going to choose your playbook. There are, I think, nine, eight or 10 in the core book. There's another six in the expansion book. The playbook are things like the adamant, the, the bold, the, the guardian. This doesn't say anything about what kind of special techniques or tools or whatever you possess. It more speaks to what does your character care about and what are their character's beliefs and principles. But when you make a character, you choose a training. And the six trainings in the game are airbending, earthbending, sorry, air, uh, waterbending, sorry, uh, earthbending, firebending, airbending, martial artists, and technology. Those are sort of your training. Now, one of the things they say is like every character in Avatar is a proficient martial artist. They're capable, you know, they're all heroes. They're all capable of handling themselves in a fight. They're all capable of handling themselves in a dangerous situation, right? They are, they are made of, of, of strong stuff, but your training represents your special techniques. And four of them represent bending, uh, right? So you got your, you know, water, air, uh, water, earth, fire, and air, but the other two, like your technology, your martial artists, right? We, we could see how that might apply to some of our other favorite characters from the show as well. They're not benders, but they still have their their unique focus and training. And you just mark that with a little checkbox here on this character sheet. Well, in the game, all of what your character can do is basically described by this one single move, which is relying on your skills and training. When you rely on your skills and training to overcome an obstacle, gain a new insight, or perform a familiar custom, roll with your focus stat. On a hit, you get to do it. That means on a seven or higher, you did it. On a seven to nine, you do it somewhat imperfectly, and the GM will tell you how that your approach might lead to unexpected consequences. You can either accept those consequences, or you can take a point of fatigue. So fatigue, you have five points of fatigue, and once your fatigue is capped out, you can't take any more fatigue until you rest or until someone guides or comforts you. So what does this mean? It means, now by the way, it means if I wanna airbend, now if I just wanna airbend just to look cool, I'm not using my skills and training to overcome an obstacle or gain a new insight or perform a familiar custom, so there's no move involved. But if I describe how the, you know, the airship is getting away and you're, you know, your airbender describes how they 
to run to the edge of the cliff and then just, you know, have a huge gust of wind behind them to propel them up so that they can catch up with the escaping airship. I think we all agree that you are relying on your skills and training to overcome an obstacle and we would roll and we would see what happens. That's it. That's in the game. That's the bending move. Okay. That's it. It doesn't really care how you do it. That's up for us as the players to sort of decide why, it, how and why it looks cool. By the way, there might be a situation where so you're like, oh, so I can use water bending to do anything. I can use air bending to do anything. No, because if you describe something that you're doing with your bending, remember, you don't take actions. You don't take the rely on your skills and training action. We have a conversation and you describe what your character is doing. And if what you're describing and what you're doing don't trigger this rely on your skills and training move, you never get to roll. And the GM just gets to tell you what happens. So that's where the kind of d mental distinction Lolly comes in. Hey, Lolly, dollars. thank you. Thanks for doing a deep dive on this system. We'll catch the void later. Earth Dawn deep dive when? Thank you for that. Check out the VOD. Let me know what you think. Um, Earth Dawn deep dive. You know what? I, like we should get Donnie on. He's the Earth Dawn master. And I, I'm, I'm in for it. Um, I'm on a cruise. I'm here this week and then I'm on a cruise. But, you know, like. Again, I, I really like doing three streams a week if I can, you know, uh, you know, keep the interest level if people are showing up and, you know, I mean, it, it kind of sucks to do a stream and, you know, get seven people and five dollars in tips for the whole night. But when, you know, you all show up and you guys support me and everyone's over here, com you know, communicating and conversating and watching the VOD like that makes it a lot more likely that I'm going to do three streams a week. And that's how we can fit in stuff like Earth Dawn. So I'd love to do that. So thank you, Lollipop, for that. Um. Let's see here. Um, so yeah, so the, the, the point is bending isn't what makes an avatar character special or a hero. Bending is just the flavor of how they deal with the challenges and obstacles around them. What's what, what the avatar game is really about is it's about overcoming problems and dealing with your principles and dealing with the emotional consequences and weight of your actions. That's even what the show is about, right? So that is what this game is principally and primarily concerned about, which is why the main move for doing bending shit is just this. And it's just kind of a free platform for players to, you know, Describe their cool thing. Now, I said all that because when you go into what's called the combat exchange, you are going to be in a situation where I got to find it here. You are going to be in a situation where you are going to kind of have a sort of combat system and you have different techniques that you can use. And this is where if you're an airbender, you can have different techniques than say a water bender or an earth bender would have. Like you can have the air cushion, the air swipe, the cannonball, the breath of wind, the shock wave, the vortex, the twisting wind, the wind run. So these all work within the context of the combat exchange system, which quite frankly, is it's fairly complex. I mean, it's it's not the most you know, complicated uh, combat system that's ever existed, but it is much more complex than any other PBTA game I've ever seen in terms of dealing with this stuff. Normally in a PBTA game, you would just basically solely and strictly rely on moves like relying on your skills and training. That being said, you could play Avatar and never use any of the techniques at all. You could you could just completely skip the combat exchange system. You could completely skip all the fire bending techniques and air bending techniques if you wanted to. The reason that I think they did this is because emotional conversations, coming to terms with who you are, finding balance between the, the conflicting principles that guide your character and trying to do what's right in a world that isn't always, uh, you know, doesn't always have make the most sense with a lot of shades of gray. It's very much what Avatar is about. And 
cool elemental martial arts, right? Like that's a big part of the show as well. And I think that's part of the reason why they said, you know what, we are going to put this into the game because if we go back to our play pattern, the way I kind of see it is, you know, this is like an opportunity for you to sort of be like, okay, we're going to do the, you know, the, the crunchy combat exchange where there's a lot of action and cool fire bending and air bending and, you know, lots of neat, fun martial artist stuff. And then we're going to go into the emotional fallout scenes. And then we're going to go to dealing with those emotional fallout scenes. And then we're going to get back to trying to deal with the issue. And then we're going to have another cool martial arts elemental bending fight, right? It's not designed in a way that it's like every scene is just, I want to talk about my feelings, but it's also not designed that like every scene is just another knockdown drag out, you know, uh, combat encounter right so that's kind of where i think the balance of the game is and i do think that that gives it a little bit of a a little bit of a uh, of a leg up if you don't mind doing the extra work of all these you know techniques and all this other stuff and going through this combat exchange process um all that being said it's also kind of cool like a, a part of avatar is the idea that these characters are learning techniques and developing techniques um you know the, the story of avatar the last airbender was very much a story of of maybe not tough, but you know, tough, I guess, to develop metal bending, but Katara, you know, learning more about water bending to become a great water bending master of Aang mastering his elements. And even Zuko, who is an accomplished firebender towards the end of the, you know, the, the show kind of tapped into like some of the rare secret forbidden secret, like lightning redirection and learning from the dragons about the true nature of fire bending, that it wasn't about fire. It was about energy. It was about life. It was about, you know, the primal substance that, that empowers us all. It was almost a, a, a force for good, not necessarily a force for destruction. So like there were, there were these really cool moments within the show that were all tied around bending and I don't hate it. You know, I like it. So that is how the fire bending and the air bending and stuff works in a combat exchange where these techniques really only matter or apply in combat, if that makes any sense. Um, otherwise, you just kind of use the basic, you know what, just tell us how your skills and training were really cool. Um, so we just described skills and training, obviously for a while here. So I did want to talk about the last two actions because the two, this is another cool thing that avatar or that magpie, the game company that makes this, they do this in root as well. Um, I think they do this in urban chat, uh, masks as well. And it's a technique I really, really, really like, which is they basically give you two different actions, two different moves for quote unquote doing stuff. Okay, in Pathfinder two terms, relying on your skills and training. Oh, by the way, wait, oh, so sorry. I wanna catch up with the chat and see if there's anything I missed. Cause I was kind of going off on a rant here. Oh, I lost my mouse. Here we go. Um, let's see here. KC says, I actually found it handles realistic party dynamics better than any fantasy 20 game I've ever played because it emulates internal squabbles and arguments that have never actually happened in fantasy 20 because it's not optimal play. hundred percent agree. Um, <laughs> uh, GM Scott says, you can't say never unless you're talking about your group. I've had players in fantasy 20 game have arguments about what they're about to do, the morality or the legality as well. Um, I agree with you. And I, GM Scott, I think that this part is, I think the most important part. The game rules don't support it, but it is totally possible that happens. Absolutely. Player parties do you know, disagree about ways to go and places to do. We should go left. We should go right. You're 100% correct. In fact, my groups do that all the time. Even in like a dungeon delving campaign where it's like, we should go kill the undead and get the sword. No, we should go deal with the giants and get all the gold. Like that's totally, you know, there might be dis debates and discussions. The difference is the game rules, you know, don't, support any of that or care about any of that or have any consequences for that. It's literally just like a, a decision that you're having kind of at the table as much um, as opposed to within the game. Even if you're talking in character, the, the game mechanics don't actually support that or care about that at all. Um, let's see. Uh, so going back to what we're talking about, relying on your skills and training. 
So if you're a firebender and you're fighting some bad guys in a building and you roll an eight, maybe you win, but you also burn the building down. Uh, yeah, yeah it, it, that's basically kind of what that is. Now, to be clear, this is where the game actually gives you some cool resource choices. Because let's say that I described about how some people were trying to capture you and you're trying to escape the inn. And they, they're throwing nets down on you to try to capture you. And you say, I'm going to turn around and I'm going to swirl my cloak in my arms in a sort of flourish. And flames are going to kind of erupt from me and burn away the nets as they fall down on me to try to capture me. And I say, awesome. You're relying on your skills and training. Roll with plus focus. You roll. You get an eight or a nine. And I say, you do it. The, the nets don't capture you. You're going to escape. But you're reckless display of fire bending inside of a wooden inn catches it starts to catch it on fire as a player you can either say cool that's fine i'll deal with that or you can mark a point of fatigue and say no i don't actually do that like um you know i i'm able to control it enough that even though the fire bursts out like nothing catches on fire and there's no problem so again it's a player choice like that fatigue resource gives you the ability to sort of control the narrative a little bit. But if your character starts to get fatigued, you know, they're exhausted, they've been pushed to the limit, their ability to maintain control of their bending starts to get away from them a little bit. You know, Avatar doesn't shy away from the fact, and I think Legend of Korra did a little bit better job of this, but, you know, there's a great scene uh, from Avatar The Last Airbender where they do this too, where like, I think Aang is learning firebending and he gets really excited about how powerful firebending is. And I think he ends up hurting Katara. Um, that's like a great example of this kind of mechanic um, because bending in the Avatar verse is kind of a, a power, you know, that, that, you know, man was not meant to mess with in a way, right? Like there, there's an idea of it being this kind of scary and powerful force. And, you know, this things like this relying on your skills and training kind of reinforce that. It also kind of ties into the idea that your characters are young heroes. This is a, by the way, I should, I should have pointed this out. A core component to this game is that your characters, kind of like the masks game from Magpie, you're young. You're not, you're not 10 or 11 like, you know, Aang was or whatever. But the idea is that your characters are, you know, they're not adults. They're not masters. They're not people who have, you know, mass, they, they are teenagers or, you know, maybe 18 or 19 or 20. They're young and they aren't in full control of these powers, these powers, which can be very powerful and devastating. And so part of the part of the allure, part of the fun of the game is dealing with the fact that your control of these primal cosmic forces is imperfect. And sometimes it leads to consequences that you don't have. And so in the narrative even, but mechanically as well, if your character starts to gain, accumulate too much fatigue, and if all five of your fatigue boxes are filled up, then when you try to rely on your skills and training and you get a seven to nine and there's an unforeseen consequences, you cannot mark fatigue that you don't have available. And so your character, when starting to get a little bit frazzled and pushed and exhausted, is going to have a very hard time maintaining control of their bending. And I, I think that's, you know, one of my favorite parts of the, the game as well. Um, let's see here. Boothby, you're gaming. Happy Easter. Glad to have you here, buddy. Um, I like crunchy combat, so I'm fine with that. And in fact, I prefer it. Yeah, if you like crunchy combat, I think the combat exchange system is actually really great. It's not crunchy like Pathfinder 2 crunchy, but it is pretty good. Um, the other thing about it, which I think Darth Gorlock is kind of getting at, is the idea is that an avatar, and this is true, by the way, as well, they, they call them combat exchanges, not fights. The idea is, is that a lot of times an avatar, like there's a, a fight breaks out and there's sort of a, a quick exchange of martial arts moves and bending and earth bending and fire bending or air bending. There's kind of like a, a clash. And then there's like a moment where it's like, why did you attack us? It's like, why did you attack us? Because we're after the fire nation people. We're after the fire nation people. Wait, you're not the fire nation people. We thought you were the fire nation people, right? It's not just like combat round, grind, 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 grind until everybody's done. In avatar, you do essentially one combat round at a time. And there's like a break in between each combat round where you sort of say, okay, that combat exchange, 
you did a cool flurry of martial arts maneuvers. The NPCs did a cool flurry of martial arts maneuvers. Everybody did a cool thing or a bending thing. Everybody got to do one thing. And now that combat exchange is closed. And now we're sort of back to the conversation. Now that conversation might lead to another combat exchange, which is fine. But it's it sort of the default assumption is that you basically are doing one combat exchange at a time with breaks in between them for, for dialogue, for moves like tricking and intimidating and guiding and comforting, right? Like all of these moves still matter even in a quote unquote combat. The combat exchange just rep represents that like, you know, 15 or 20 or 30 seconds on screen where suddenly everybody's doing really cool, fancy, awesome martial arts maneuvers and it it's fun and it's exciting. But if you watch Avatar, you'll see, or even just like a Marvel combat movie, you know, I, I think about that a combat exchange between Iron Man, Winter Soldier, Bucky, and Captain America at the end of Civil War. It's not just fight, 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 fight. It's like there's a clash of combat, then things are exchanged. New revelations are made. There's a clash of combat. A character makes an important moral decision and defends their friend. They have a conversation. There's a clash of combat, right? It's this constant back and forth that makes the fighting part of the dialogue, part of the narrative. And that's what makes it so exciting. It's not just combat for combat's sake. It, it's, a, it's a dramatic underpinning to this, you know, moment of tension. And that's what makes it so fun. Um, let's see. Um... KC is definitely interested in the game now, but the stream also convinced me to rewatch uh, Atla at Avatar The Last Airbender. Um, <laughs> I rewatched Atla and uh, Legend of Korra and I bought the books because of reading this game. <laughs> um, that's funny. Um, yeah, I, I think Avatar The Last Airbender is fantastic. I mean, it's a kid's show, but it 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 gets better, uh, you know, not better, but it gets more serious as the show goes on. But it is a kid's show, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's dismissible, right? Um, so taking fatigue is like resist from scum and villainy. GM Scott. Yes. Taking fatigue is a lot like resist. Um, not as powerful, definitely not as powerful as Darth Gorlock says, but fatigue. A lot of times GM Scott is a way where it's like your character might take a condition from an NPC or you could take fatigue. So it's like fatigue is a way for you to sort of avoid having things that you don't want to have happen, happen to a certain extent. So it is, I think it's a lot like resist from scum and villainy, um, blades in the dark, which is why I like it so much. Cause that's my favorite mechanic from forge in the dark games is resistance. Um, so I think it's really, really cool. Um, um, Ayla says, I actually enjoy the idea of representing collateral damage in a more logical way. Think about all the superhero movies and shows where an entire city block gets leveled because a couple of demigods decided to duke it out. And it's just glossed over like it's no big deal. Exactly. Um, uh, <laughs> and then everybody started complaining about how bad the second, uh, the Batman versus Superman movie was, which is fine. Um, so, okay, the last thing I want to talk here about was um, the help action we'll do last, but... One of the things that Magpie does, which I really like, is they basically divide the you do something move into two different moves. First is rely on your skills and training. And the other one is called push your luck. Now, what's interesting about this, number one, is they each rely on a different score. Or, uh, sorry, a different stat. Characters that are extremely focused and disciplined are gonna find that they have an easier time doing the things that they know how to do. AKA, I am a trained airbender. I am a trained martial artist. I have a very high focus. I am very good at doing the things that I know how to do. But in, in, in Pathfinder 2 terms, this move here, rely on your skills, um, would be like, um, you know, the skill that you have master training in with a good stat, right? Um, and, an, and, and an item bonus to your to your uh, skill check. It's, you know, your primary weapon proficiency, right? It's the thing that your character is good at and you are good at getting things done, which is great. But what Magpie does with their modern PBTA games like Masks, which is a superhero, teenage superhero game, Root, which, uh, you know, is sort of an anthropomorphic Game of Thrones, and then Avatar, is they typically give you two 
actions. They have your skills and training move, and then they have your push your luck move. Now in Pathfinder 2, this would be your skill that you're not trained in. <laughs> this would be your skill that maybe you just have a bare amount of training in. This would be maybe the action that the rules don't really cover and there is no feat or ability for it. And instead, um, you know, and like, like untrained improvisation, Sean, but the difference is like untrained improvisation still kind of sucks, right? Because your bonus in Pathfinder 2 is still very low. Untrained improvisation lets you add your level, but when you're higher level going against level DCs, the game expects for you to have a good stat and master proficiency and an item bonus. The fact of the matter is you're probably unlikely to succeed. So what this game does is it says, look, if you're doing something that you are very well trained in, then you roll this move. If you're doing something that you're not really trained in or that no one is trained in, it's just a crazy risky push your luck maneuver, then we have the push your luck action. Now, by the way, this could even be bending, right? Like, if we establish, if you're trying to do something with your bending that maybe we've established isn't within your training, it's not within your skill set, then you're not relying on your skills and training. You're pushing your luck. Or if you try to do something with your bending and the, you know, the G, and you know, like you describe what you're doing with your air bending or your earth bending, and the GM kind of looks at you and, and, you know, someone starts reaching for, uh, you know, the dice to roll, rely on your skills and training. You know, the GM might stop for a moment and say, hold up a second. You're trying to do what? I don't know if you're, you know, again, remember, we're having a conversation. We're deciding what move is, is the correct choice, which one is applicable. It's not a choice, KC. It's as a group, as a player, as a GM, I would ultimately say the GM has the final say. Like, Let's say that um, I describe how, uh, you know, an earthquake strikes a town and a cliffside starts to collapse and an earthbender tries to keep the entire cliff from collapsing. And I say, that doesn't sound like you're relying on your skills and training because that is just way too big and that is way too much for you to handle. Would you agree? And the player might go, yeah, you know what? This is less... This isn't about my focus and my training, right? This is about my passion and my, my, like my will to just, you know, try to keep this thing from going, you know, maybe, maybe my character's screaming, you know, sinking into the earth as they're trying to bend this. This isn't me relying on my skills and training. This is me pushing my luck. And the key thing with this lets you do in the game is it means is even if your character is bad at something or isn't trained in something or skilled in something they can still do it with a pretty reasonably good chance of success by using push your luck but the cool thing about it is pushing your luck always kind of has a cost see even if you succeed okay on a push your luck roll the gm is going to tell you what it costs you and the gm can make that cost kind of whatever they want Right. So, you know, if, if a character rolls to main, you know, I, I say keeping up an entire mountainside from collapsing is well outside of your abilities, of your skills and your training. You're going to have to roll push your luck. And the player says, OK, they, they roll plus passion. They get a hit. They do it. They succeed. But I tell them, OK, but you need to mark th two fatigue or three fatigue, um, you know, or something like that. Because that was really, really tough for you. Um, or, you know, as a GM, I could say, okay, yep, you, you, you maintain that, you know, the, the, the cliffside does not collapse. Um, but there's some other consequence because it's just, you're not in full control here. And that's where it can be a kind of an interesting uh, mechanic because it gives players a way to always do something interesting and always do something fun and and have something that they can pull out their sleeve but it's not perfect you know if, if you get a, a seven if you get a 10 plus or seven even if on a seven to nine with relying on your skills and training seven to nine is going to cause a, a problem but you can just pay one fatigue and make that problem go away 
Pushing your luck doesn't have the ability to pay one fatigue and make the problem go away. Push your luck. If there's a consequence and there's going to be, you have to accept it and you have to deal with it. Okay. And so that's where push your luck is quote unquote, not as good as relying on your skills and training. But what it does is it allows you as a group to sort of decide what is within my character's skills and training. In that case, we're going to be rolling focus. What is outside of my character's skills and training? It could even be an airbending technique and I'm an airbender, but it's just such an advanced form of airbending that maybe we don't think that it really is relying on my skills and training. It's more like me pushing my luck, but it could also be things like I'm going to try to, you know, I'm going to leap out of the window and try to, you know, fall through the sky and hit every, you know, awning on the way down. And it's like, okay, you could totally do that action. Is that, is your character like a super trained circus acrobat? Do you have that background? Are you that, I can't remember her character's name. I think it's May from uh, Avatar The Last Airbender, the really nimble girl who grew up in the circus. You might say, oh, for her, that's rely on your skills and training, go for it. But for a character like Sokka, you know, or or Toph, you might say, no, you're, you're just pushing your luck, you know? Just roll with your luck and see what consequences come out of that. And I think that's what makes it so interesting. Um, yeah, uh, Toph figuring out how to earthbend the first time when she's trapped in the cage, that's not her relying on her skills and training. She's literally pushing her luck. She's trying to do something and she's not using her focus, right? She's using her passion. And that's exactly where I think those moments in the show are what led them to create these moves. Um, KC, I missed the middle part of the stream, so it might have been covered, but are there any sort of meta currency or help mechanic that you can improve the odds of a push your luck? No. In fact, Powered by the Apocalypse games usually don't have meta currency. And the reason they don't have meta currency is because meta currency exists for games where you have a fairly, I'll say, unbiased resolution mechanic, but we all accept that we want certain outcomes to happen. Hero points in Pathfinder 2 are probably the best example of this, right? The Pathfinder 2 system doesn't care whether you succeed or fail. All it's trying to model is how good are you? How hard is the task? Roll the dice. It doesn't care if this is a really important moment to your campaign. And it would be really awesome if the person succeeded right now. Pathfinder 2 doesn't care about that. All it cares about is what's the DC, what's your ability, or what's your total modifier. Hero points come in and say, oh, I'll give you a second roll at it, right, if you fail. So in a way, hero points are that meta currency because the resolution mechanic is uncaring and unfeeling. Powered by the Apocalypse games, including Avatar, typically do not, in fact, I, don't, I can't think of any of them, that really have a meta currency model because they don't want you to be able to do that. They want failure to be totally on the table. They want every dice roll to be interesting. They want failure, which is again, why I think calling it a miss or failure is wrong, isn't really failure. In Pathfinder 2, if I don't roll high enough, it's a failure, and that means that you know the cool thing that we wanted to have happen doesn't happen. In Powered by the Apocalypse, that's not the case. If you don't, quote, roll high enough, it's the GM's move, and I get to decide what happens, which could be that you succeed, because of course you succeed, because it's an awesome moment in the story, and we want that. But what you didn't want to have happen was this horrible other consequence or this big problem or this massive fallout or this sudden realization that the whole time you've actually been working for the enemy. That's what you didn't want to have happen. But that is what I'm going to make happen. But in terms of like that awesome moment of success, it's almost like guaranteed because if the player succeeds, obviously the player succeeded and they're going to get what they want. If the player rolls low and fails, it's my decision what happens. And I could decide you succeed, <laughs> but there's a problem or there's a consequence. I get to feel that out. It's not fudging. That is not fudging because that's literally the role of the game master in this game. And I don't get to just do that willy nilly. I only get to do that when you roll six or less. So that's why they don't have that KC. Um, is fatigue unique to Avatar in that regard? No, Aelia. Um, Root has fatigue as well, and I don't remember if Masks does. I think, I think Masks has conditions. Root has fatigue, and I think 
Avatar has both. <laughs> Avatar is probably the most complex, complicated, both, because uh, I think we described earlier what the difference is between complex and complicated. Uh, Avatar Legends is by far probably the most complex and complicated PBTA game that I've ever read or experienced, for sure. Certainly has the long, I mean, unlike most PBTA games are in that, you know, small uh, digest size, but, you know, it's a full book in in their game. Um, GM Scott says, the hero point system for PA2 is modeled to allow you to roll a one two times in a row. By the way, funny story. I know we're in the middle of an Avatar stream. Friday, we, we started up a Pathfinder 2 game. We're going back to Abomination Vaults to finish it up. And everybody kind of, some people like retconned and sort of remade their characters. Other people made new characters. We kind of started off where we finished off last time. We did some minor tweaks to the narrative to make it make sense. And then we kept playing. And, I, and one of the changes was when we first played this, we had my Derek Hero Point rules. And I said, no, you know what? Let's just, you know, everybody said it was Pathfinder 2 so easy. We don't need all these special extra rules. We'll just use normal Hero Points. It'll be fine. And we were towards the end of the session and Bob missed. And someone was like, oh, Bob, you still have, he's like, does everybody get a hero point? I'm like, yeah, Bob, everybody starts with one. He goes, I'll use a hero point. So it's the first hero point of the new Pathfinder 2E campaign. And he rolled a nat one on the reroll. <laughs> so it's like, it was perfect. <laughs> um, anyway, it was really good. Um, Sean, if you consider Iron Sworn or Blades in the Dark to be plowed by the apocalypse, then they have some meta currency in momentum and stress. The difference though, Sean, is that, and my knowledge of Iron Sworn, I've played Starforge, but I haven't played Iron Sworn, but it's pretty much similar. But in Blades of the Dark, stress is only a way to handle consequences. Stress does not change your success. Um, I, I guess pushing yourself gives you an extra die. So I guess, I guess in that regard, it is. I guess. So yeah, maybe it does have a little bit, a little bit of one. So maybe you're right. I don't know. I, stress is sort of a weird meta currency, but I, I get what you're saying. So actually, I I, I, res, I rescind it and say you're right. <laughs> um, uh, 100%. Every time my players roll hero points, they always roll lower, better. I use Eminem style hero points for that reason. I love Eminem style hero points um, for sure, because I, I completely agree with everything that you're just saying there. It was just really funny because we're like, no, we'll just use it straight up. Normal. No, we'll use normal hero point rules and then just nat one. It was just... So crazy. Um, so what I call fatigue a meta currency. Um, I, I I call it, it is a meta, it's kind of a meta currency because it does represent your character being fatigued, right? The idea is, is that your character, when they have are exhausted, are unable to control their bending as much. When they are, you know, not exhausted, uh, they can, you know, get, a little more exhausted to kind of control their bending a bit more. So there is a real life analog to it. So I wouldn't call it a full meta currency in that regard. It does make a, some amount of sense. Um, <laughs> Magpie should kick us some money. I just bought the book. <laughs> um, uh, not a drummer. Our buddy George says that was me. No, wait, that was Bob. It was Bob. It was definitely Bob. Um, thank you. Negative four one one, by the way, um, the uh, <laughs> there is a uh, Darth Garlic says negative four one. There is a drive through affiliate link in the description, but don't worry, I forgot about it all the time too. Yes, that's my friendly reminder. If someone does pick up a book, I mean that's awesome. You should totally do that. But we do have a dis uh, in our dis if you're a member of our Patreon, that's awesome. If you're supporting us on the channel through uh, uh, in the our um, adventurer and being a member of the channel, that's great. If you've donating, streamed super chats, stream elements, that's awesome. But if you don't want to give us any money at all but you still like the show and you want to support us, we do have a link in the description to our drive through RPG affiliate link. So maybe you click that, you bookmark that. I think it stays in your cookie for about a week. But basically, if you use that link, when you go to drive through RPG, any PDF or print on demand that you buy from drive through RPG won't cost you any amount of extra money. Instead, drive through RPG is only gonna, it gives us like a 1%, one, 1%, one percent, I think, or 2% kickback on, so if you go and buy a $20 PDF, uh, you know, I think we might get like 50 cents or something. It's not a lot of money, but you know, it all adds up over time and, and might buy the, the nights, uh, an extra round or two of, uh, of beer or pizza, um, a month. And it's really appreciated. It doesn't cost you any extra money. It's just a nice, a nice little way for you to show some extra support for the channel. If money's tight and, or you hate us and you don't want to give us any of your money, that's respectable too. But, um, anyways, um, 
Thank you, Darth Gorlock, for reminding that. Also, remember, too, if you're interested in these conversations, you want to be part of these votes that help us decide what we're going to talk about. If you want to continue these conversations, maybe you want to play in an Avatar The Last Airbender game because, for example, Darth Gorlock here in the chat is currently running an Avatar The Last Airbender game. I think it's full, but that doesn't mean that there might not be another Avatar The Last Airbender game. We have a bunch of community games on our Discord, which is a private Discord available only to our patrons. Um, and, uh, yeah, so... Uh, you know, good stuff all around. Uh, no, negative for one. That's totally fine. Listen, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take I'll take your seven bucks <laughs> over your 25 cents. So thank you for your support. Trust me. <laughs> it, it is well appreciated. Uh, uh, you, you, you already did good, sir. You already did good. Um, or ma'am. I don't know. Sorry. Uh, uh, Ayla says, so Derek, your story reinforces my philosophy and stance on PF2 hero points. They should be powerful and reliably useful. Or they should not be in the game at all. I'd be fine with ditching them. Yeah, I, that actually makes sense. If if something's going to be in the game to do this narrative thing, then at least let it be powerful and useful. Um, uh, not sure everyone's operating on the same definition of meta currency. Yeah, so meta currency to me, in the purest form, is a is a mechanic that the players have that. It doesn't have any sort of analog in the game world. Uh, fate points, hero points, what are those? They, they don't make any sense in the context of the game. So that's a pure meta currency. And then you can use those to affect the outcome of the game in a way that is beneficial for you as a player. Um, that is what a true, and, and also too, typically meta currencies have a kind of a pseudo cost associated with them or, or the idea is that they are supposed to encourage a certain type of behavior. Hero points in Pathfinder 2 are in theory designed to encourage you to act heroically because that is what's going to get you more future hero points. So fate points in fate are designed to get you to use your aspects against yourself. So that is what a meta currency is in the truest sense of the form. Something like stress or fatigue starts blurring that line a little bit because there is a sort of an analog to what it is in the game and the, there could be some narrative and fictional interfaces with it. But it's, it, it becomes more of a resource than a meta currency, right? It's more of a resource. Hit points are a resource if you think about it. Every time I get hit with a weapon in d and I'm dead unless I spend an amount of hit point resource equal to the damage roll of the weapon, right? Like that's a way to think of hit points as a resource mechanic. And, you know, there is obviously a somewhat of an analog from hit points to how much physical punishment I've taken, but it's kind of blurry because you're like, what is hit points really representing? I'm not quite sure. Um, so that's kind of, you know, I think that, I think that fatigue and, and stress are more in that hit point model of, resource than meta currency in a truest sense um to me meta currency is a resource the player spends to change an unfavorable result to a favorable one and they are completely divorced from the simulation of the game world i mean yes i would agree with you that is the truest form of that so to finish up here as we get it close to 10 um we talked about how this game has Assess the situation, like almost all player Powered by the Apocalypse games, as a way for the player to get additional information about the game. This is recall knowledge, you know, on on crack. It's it's research. It's 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 powerful. It's useful. It's well defined, and the questions it allows you to ask are specifically targeted and directed, so that you're not asking useless or pointless questions. These questions are designed to push you towards solutions that are going to push the story forward who who who's the greatest danger here what's what should i be looking for just tell me don't i don't want to play whack-a-mole with recall knowledge and figuring out what the fuck is going on let me just make the damn roll and get my answers and then we can actually have agency and make real decisions so assess the situation then we have three ways to deal with npcs we can plead with them we can intimidate them and we can trick them telling us that this game is about social interaction with npcs there's three moves that deal with that guiding and comforting is sort of that other pillar of play which is you know we we're, we're taking these dramatic actions we're dealing with these um problematic situations but that creates emotional fallout on our characters 
and we have to have a way to deal with that. The show highlights how many, I mean, I don't know about you, but if you're an Avatar The Last Airbender fan, I mean, for I think for most of us, some of the best moments of the entire show are like scenes between Zuko and Iroh, where Iroh is trying to guide and comfort Zuko. Um, I mean, I, I, those I think for many people, especially I think as you get older, I mean, those are the most poignant and meaningful moments in the whole show, really. And so, so much of this, and certainly with even with Team Avatar, with Aang going through his journey and being, you know, having to deal with the emotional turmoil that comes with growing up, that comes with being the Avatar, that comes with being this powerful bender. So much of the show is about that. So guide and comfort is a fantastic way to deal with that. And as all of this stuff is not just fluffy bullshit time. These are all underpinned, you know, underpinned to the mechanics of the game. And then we have the two sort of moves that we use to quote, do stuff in the game, which is just rely on your skills and training, AKA if this is something that we have decided when you play, when you make a character in um, Avatar, uh, you'll talk about your background. You'll pick one of the six backgrounds for your character. You'll pick your training. And then we'll also talk about your character. And um, it, uh, those, those things will be the basis for what falls under your skills and training. That might be even a conversation that you have in the middle of the session, right? Like your character might have grown up as an outlaw and now they're an earthbender. And so when we're getting to a point and you have to break into a earth kingdom vault, um, you know, your character goes, step aside, I could pick a lock. And everyone goes, you can? And then you go, yeah, my background's outlaw. Um, and you make up a little story. You go, oh yeah, like when I was a teen, I used to just run with these street gangs. We would break and enter all the time. We didn't ever like beat anybody up. We weren't like thugs. We didn't, you know, kill anybody or, or rough anybody up. But breaking and entering, you know, uh, cat burglary, like that was my jam. Yep, I am, this is something that is within my skills and training. So I'm gonna roll plus focus and I'm gonna get us into this, you know, into this Earth Kingdom vault. And it's like, okay, cool. We we learned a little bit more about your character and, um, you know, also the narrative moved forward. It's pretty cool. What did you miss? Uh, Jason, you missed me uh, talking about Powered by the Apocalypse for three hours and breaking down the eight basic moves. Um, yeah, Sean, exactly. Just like 13th Age backgrounds. Exactly. Flexible, flexible. Because maybe there's a moment where somebody says, you know, there another player might say, is that really a part of your, you know, is that really appropriate for your background? And, you know, you might say, mm, maybe you're right, but I could see a world where maybe my character did do that thing. And because of this and that other story, and it's like, if everybody's sitting there around the table, you know, nodding their head and going, yeah, that sounds like a really cool story. I mean, I totally think that's part of your character's skills and training. Then that just becomes part of your skills and training. The fictional component of the rea of your fictional reality over trumps the mechanics. And we all just say, yes, you can do that now. Cool. Um, uh, no, 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 no blame there, Jason. Absolutely. Dinner with the family always comes first. You can always watch the VOD, sir. You can always watch the VOD. Um, and so if you're not good at something, instead of this game saying, get fucked, you can't do it. You have the push your luck mechanic, which does carry with it some additional consequences because, you know, things might get messy because you're not as trained, you're not as in control of the consequences as you would be when you do it with your skills and training, but that doesn't mean you can't get it done. And that's what makes it pretty cool. So the last action, the last basic move, which is very simple, doesn't even involve dice rolls, is helping. When you take an appropriate action to help a companion, mark a fatigue and give them a plus one to their roll after their role. This means, this is like, this is the aid action, but a couple things. Number one, it does take a point of fatigue and we don't have a lot of fatigue. We only have, you know, five fatigue. So we can't just go, I aid, I aid, you know, in, in 5e D&D, &D, I help, I give them advantage. I help, I give them advantage, I help. I give them advantage. If you aid somebody or if you help somebody, uh, it does cost you a fatigue. You cannot do it all the time. This is as much a game balance thing as it is a a you know story thing. 
Secondly, you can do it after the roll, which means you only need to help someone if it would make a difference. <laughs> so if somebody rolls a six and I can help them, that'll pump it up to a seven. If somebody rolls a nine, I can help them and that will pump it up to a 10. So those are the only times where it makes any amount of sense, um, you know, to help somebody. Uh, I'm not sure. I'd have to check the rules if multiple people can help. Um, I'm assuming that they can. So there might be a world where somebody gets a five. And if in the fiction, your two friends are in position to help you and they're both willing to take a fatigue, then you might be able to add plus two to your role. But I can't be 100% sure. I'm sure there's more. This is just the, the shorthand. I, I would have to actually double check that rule. But anyways, um, and that's it. It's very basic. But keep in mind, to do it, you have to do it. You can't just say, I help. Give him, give him plus one. That doesn't work. That won't trigger the help move. That You can't take the help action. You have to just use the dialogue, use the conversation, describe what your character is doing. Now, you might be very clearly trying to help them, but then, boom, it will trigger, and everyone will go, okay, mark a fatigue and get a help. But you have to describe what you're doing to make sense that it, that it actually helps this person. If you can't do that, then, you know, then it doesn't help. So... If an earthbender is trying to break down a, you know, a, a door and it's, you know, they, they roll a six and then the airbender describes how they come up next to the airbender and they focus their air blast and they're shunning into the door too. Everybody around the table is going to nod and say, that makes total sense. Then you get to plus one, you get the seven, boom, the door slams open and you break out. Everybody's like, cool. That was, makes sense. You still have to do it. You still have to describe it. You still have to go through it. Um, Bernardo, did I explain balance? No, Bernardo. This time I talked a lot about Powered by the Apocalypse for like the first hour. And then for the next two, I talked about the basic moves. We are going to do a second deep dive because these things usually do take um, at least me two to three sessions. I think Sentinels of the Multiverse took two sessions. Legend of the Five Rings, I think, took three live streams. Next time we're going to talk about balance and we're going to talk about balance moves and That'll be our primary focus in the next session or next thing is going to be balance and balance moves. And we probably will talk about playbooks a little bit. And then if we do a third one, and again, we had some really nice support tonight, $135 in tips and donations. Thank you so much to everybody for doing that. That is awesome. Thank you. That is what keeps me doing this. Because again, doing a video about Avatar, The Last Airbender, is not going to get me as many views as doing yet another Pathfinder 2 video, or certainly me doing a 5th edition D&D &D or a 1D&D &D drama video would get me. I rely on passionate, interested, and invested players and patrons and viewers who support us through their tips, their donations, and their Patreon contributions in order for me to be able to make this kind of content because otherwise I'd be chasing views. I don't have to chase views because you all support me. Anyways, long story short, if this session is, uh, if this stream is well supported, we will probably then do a third uh, deep dive where we talk about the combat exchange system, which is kind of its its own whole thing. So next time we'll probably talk about playbooks and the balance and the balance moves. And then if we get a chance to do the third, uh, we'll do, we'll talk about the combat exchange system and the techniques system as well. Um, Darth says, uh, Ayla, you will deal with a lot of emotional baggage in this game law, but for the most part, you will succeed in your overall goal. It's more about the cost to your principles and how it shapes you. Absolutely. Couldn't agree with you more. I mean, to be fair, Powered by the Apocalypse games, I, I, I'll kind of go off onto a, a little bit of a, of a side tangent here as we kind of move into the end wrap-up phase. Um, one of the rules of Powered by the Apocalypse, and this is true even for, um, you know, this is true even for this game, is when someone rolls a six minus on a dice roll, it's the GM's ability to make a move. And the phrase uh, that always gets used um, all the time is that, um, you know, the GM can make, the GM can make as hard of a move as they would like. So what does that mean? Well, The game, basically, all these Apocalypse Worlds games, 
talk about how as a GM, sometimes you make moves that are very, very hard. You're basically saying you're taking damage. You are in trouble. You're in prison. You're, you know, on fire. It's a very dramatic and immediate action. Soft moves are more like, hey, the fireball is coming at you. What do you want to do? If you do nothing, then you're going to be on fire. But if you try to dodge out of the way, maybe it's another opportunity for you to get it out of the way. Um, instead of they arrest you and take you to jail and throw you in prison and lock it, throw away the key, I say the guardsmen begin approaching you with manacles and shackles to imprison you. What do you do? So when you get a six minus, a big part of this is the GM gets to kind of legitimately mechanically allowed by the rules fudge kind of as much as they want to given where the storyline is i don't have to make a hard move i can make a soft move i don't have to make things horrible i don't even have to make it difficult for the pcs the six minus means i get to make my move i get to decide where the game goes in this moment and then we go back to the dialogue where it's kind of a give and a take um, GM Scott, this is where position and effect come into play, but Powered by the Apocalypse does not have that. That is kind of one of the, the addendum features to Blades in the Dark that they really mechanically codified position and effect. Because I think you're right, GM Scott. If if I describe, no, 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 that's totally fine. I, 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 my point is position and effect kind of exist in this game even if they aren't explicitly defined. I think we all understand that if my character is dangling from the top of a two-story or three-story building, they are in not as much danger as if they were dangling off the edge of some 500-foot cliffs of insanity, right? And so that is where the idea of position effect. Now, in Blades in the Dark, they, you, know, you would go and codify that and say, you are in a desperate situation. If you fail, you will get severe or major consequence. And like everybody understands that. Whereas if you're sort of, you know, jumping from rooftop to rooftop on two and three story buildings, I might say, oh, this is just risky. You know, it's not desperate. So the consequences, even if you fail, aren't nearly as bad. If, you know, you stumble and fall and kind of break through a, uh, you know, some, uh, uh, and into a cart and fall onto the street below, you know, you might bust up your leg, you might sprain your ankle, but you're not going to be a splattered red pile of bones on the ground, which might be the consequence if you fail that desperate action while you're hanging from the 500 foot cliff. That's where position and effect comes in. In Blades in the Dark, it's codified. In Powered by the Apocalypse, it's kind of part of that shared understanding a big part of playing powered by the apocalypse is sometimes stopping and making sure are we all on the same page i want to make sure that you understand what's going on that i understand what's going on what you're doing so that we're all operating on the same playing field that you like okay you're taking that action are you aware it, you should never be like oh you ignore the ogre and then he kills you it's like the gm should come in and say you understand that if you rush over to grab the ruby I'm going to let this ogre smash the wizard. You get that, right? Like, and you go, yes, I understand the consequences for my actions. Again, the key to player agency is not only do the players have to be free to make choices, they need to be well informed of the consequences to have the utmost agency because that way they're making real decisions instead of being getcha, gotcha, getcha, gotcha. Um, Jason says, I feel like you probably would have given up on this channel if you were chasing views. Oh, one million thousand percent, Jason. That is right on spot on the money. <laughs> um, you know, being able to talk about the games that I'm passionate about, being able to, even with Pathfinder 2, you know, like, yeah, the, the tier ratings are probably the most like mainstream stuff we do. But, you know, a lot of the stuff I talk about with Pathfinder 2 is more ph philosophical, the night school stuff. And even when we play Pathfinder 2 on the channel, you know, we I put in a lot of house rules and I change things. And, you know, even with Quest for the Frozen Flames, I change things around a lot. So, yeah, if, it, if I was just trying to get the most Internet clout, um, I probably would have given up a long time ago because, number one, it probably would not have been very successful. And number two, I, I wouldn't be able to indulge in all of the you know games and, and, and stuff that I love so much. Um, let's see here. GM Scott, hardcover for Magpie on its way. Oh my God, GM Scott, you're you're a machine. <laughs> uh, 
Don't you have enough games, GM Scott? <laughs> Uh, Nox, seems like a cool system. Thanks for the stream. I don't know how well it would go. I don't know how I would go about making an adventure around this, though. Seems like players kind of determine what happens. Nox, Nox, that is correct. Um, I would say you don't make an adventure. You just kind of create a situation. You make a couple interesting NPCs, and then you let the players go into that. You know, you might say, um, you know, there's a town where, you know, uh, the Fire Nation has moved in and they've established martial law and they're, you know, they're controlling the town and they're using the prisoners for forced labor or they're using the townsfolk for forced labor if they commit any sort of crime. And they're saying they're doing it to keep the peace. And then you and then you're like, and the reason why the town invited the Fire Nation people in is because the Fire Nation secretly bribed this band of criminals to sort of, you know, create chaos and make it so that the town would say, yes, we'll take the Fire Nation's you know, um, police force because it's better than the bandits, but it was really secretly the fire nation all along paying the bandits off. And you're like, that's it. That's my situation. Maybe I'll make an NPC here, an NPC there before the session, um, with a couple of their like motivations written down as a quick bullet point list, you know, just like two or three bullet points or two or three personality things. We didn't really talk about NPCs too much tonight, but they're pretty easy to make in the avatar verse. Um, you, uh, you basically just uh, make the, the more important NPC is kind of the more stats they have. Um, so like, like this here is a, like a simple minor NPC, right? It's a local, it's a local tough. It's the tough guy. His, they, every character gets a drive to follow orders. He gets a principal track. He gets a couple points of fatigue and he starts with a condition. He has one condition he can get angry and that's it. Unlike a player character who can get up to five conditions, the tough only has one condition angry. And then once they have angry, if they take another condition, they're out. Whereas like a major NPC has three conditions so they can take up to three conditions. And then if they take a fourth condition, they're out of action. So it's kind of like they have quote more hit points, right? Uh, and then that goes all the way up to a master NPC, such as this accomplished general. And you can see that they have just as many conditions as a PC. So this is something that should be like a major part of your campaign, a major uh, ally, a major villain uh, should be a master NPC because they are kind of on the same level as the PCs. But again, you just make one or, one or two of these and then you're right, you're not really making an adventure. You're not prepping maps you're not prop prepping scenes you're not prepping encounters you really are letting the players determine what happens that is very true uh negative thank you for the kind words thank you for enjoying the stream we're going to start wrapping up here um if it's a situation where the gm would let them succeed anyways why not just call for a roll there's a difference kc there is a difference the consequences that's the difference if the pcs win the roll they get what they want they get their cake and they get to eat it too they save the town and I don't have a party afterwards. But if I'm in a situation where I say, well, I'm not going to let the town and die and everyone die. Well, then I have to. The role isn't about whether they save the town or not. The role is about whether or not they save the town. And if are there lasting, meaningful and huge consequences? That's what you're rolling for in that situation. You're not rolling to determine if they succeed, you are rolling to determine what are the consequences for them succeeding. Um, so PPTA doesn't want the GM to indulge in gotchas. Never, 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 never. Um, for sure. This is why I like this channel. I can tell there's genuine passion and interest behind it. Yeah, I mean, I love these games. I love talking about these games. Um, GM says... Uh, I have a player where this game, okay. I have a player where this game would probably be impossible for him. He has a very hard time understanding what's going on. Even when there is a map in front of him showing exactly that. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe the map is the hard part for, you know, for him, maybe, um, thinking about individual character moments from, from time to time is, um, is maybe a little bit of an easier thing. I don't know. Maybe. It's an interesting question. Um, switch over here. 
Yeah, I know. I, as I say, as I you know go through like a five or six or seven stream series just to talk about every single one of my games, which are still laying here in in piles. All right, anyways. Um, da, da, da. Factions with goals are a GM's best friend. Absolutely, RPG Musings. Couldn't agree with you more. Uh, yeah, negative. Well, you know, uh, we're going to do at least one more. Maybe we'll do two more. Um, and again, feel free to drop comments and, you know, chat with the group. And, you know, maybe, um, you know, if you're, if you're really liking what you're seeing here and you're liking the channel, maybe join the Patreon and, and talk to us there. Um. If TTRPGs is about collaborative storytelling for real, players must be able to find what happens. This is why godlike GM DM adventures are not really collaborative storytelling. Agreed, Bernardo. And I also say this, Bernardo, and I, I'm okay with this. I think there's a group of players out there who don't want a collaborative storytelling. They want to play a very linear video game where they get to push the buttons, they get to kill the monsters, they get the cool treasure that they get to put on their character and get to make their build as they get levels and talent points and build up their talent tree or whatever. And for the most part, they're on rails and they're just, hey, GM, just tell me what the next thing is. Where do we go next? What's the next fight? Oh, that's a cool fight. What's the next fight? Oh, that's a cool fight. Oh, what's the next fight? Oh, that's a cool fight. And then credits roll. And that's the way, like, you know, a lot of people want to run their D&D campaign. A lot of players want to be a player in a and d campaign that plays out like, you know, like a God of War game. You know, just combats strewn together with cutscenes. And, you know, you push the buttons to make, you know, Kratos kill things. You're just doing that with a D20 instead of a, you know, PlayStation controller. That's it. So I'm okay with that. I mean, if that's what you want and that's what you are legitimately interested in. And if everybody's on that same page, then, yeah, I, you know, Mazel tov, That sounds great. Um, uh, exactly. Yes, exactly, Jim Scott. You got it. Right. The role's not for the victory. It's whether it's Pyrrhic or not. Yes. Uh, just a suggestion, Derek, if you do a third stream or have time in the second, maybe look at the GM moves and the era themes and moves. They do a lot to drive the game. They are very much in the weeds. Yeah, I, I, I if we have time, Darth, I, th I agree with you. Understanding the GM moves and the GM principles and the GM agendas are very important to understanding the other side of this, especially like how would I run this game? I agree with you completely. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, sweet. <laughs> I used to draw maps of dungeons in between classes as well, Jason. Very nice. Um, and then I would just ad lib the entire venture. Um, <laughs> um, so there's a game called uh, Ryu Ryutama, and it does something very interesting. There's a GM plus players, but the catch is the GM is actually a character too with their own character sheet. Right. Um, I, you know, for me personally, I think having restrictions as a game master is more fun um, because now I have to kind of, I have to play too and I don't know what's going to happen. And it's a big surprise to me and I have no idea how this is going to end up. I have no idea. And I, I love that, you know, but I, I'm playing a game where I know that whatever happens, ideally um, the mechanics are designed to push us into an interesting, dynamic, exciting tension filled but hopefully very cathartic final release of a series of you know uh, unfolding events because that's what i want i don't want balanced combats fuck that i want moments that will live in my memory and my collective memory forever you know i said that probably one of the the, the great truths of role-playing games in my personal opinion is like the brain has a really hard time i know it does for me between separating what was like a real adventure versus what was like a fake adventure. Cause in my mind, you know, I, I I've gone whitewater rafting with, you know, Smith and stuff. And it was, we, our boat flipped, went over a waterfall, went down, we went the wrong way down the class, whatever, 95 rapids. I don't know anything about white, white water rafting, which is probably why we were doing so bad. And it was this dramatic, crazy moment. And you know, we, we survived. Um, and uh, not a drummer was there as well. And it, you know what? It was, you know, for us, for me, it was like, oh, a big dramatic moment. And I had a lot of fun with that. And it lives in my memory as this awesome, cool moment. But I get it. It was expensive. It was maybe very dangerous. I don't know. I could have died. But 
I also feel that way about so many of my D and D Pathfinder campaigns and moments and my mutants and masterminds moments and my 13th age moments and my blades and dark moments where I was like, this felt like a real moment between me and my friends in this crazy dramatic over the top moment. And in my mind, the memory and the nostalgia, it lives on. And I just think that that's so powerful. And I think role-playing games have the ability to sort of like, you know, I don't know, like cross the blood brain barrier and get buried deep inside that sort of nostalgia center and and bury themselves in so that that's one of the reasons i really you know i love that stuff um gm scott says i could probably still lead you through gook down to the dead side even today because i played eq first person i played eq first person too is by the way i didn't even think back then i know there was a third person mode but I never thought to play in third person mode because I'd only ever played like Doom and Quake, which were always first person. The idea of playing that kind of game as in third person never even occurred to me. Um, yeah, exactly. RPGs can do that too. Exactly. And I, I love that, you know. Uh, combat could be a low hanging fruit for those moments, but it's conflict that creates those moments. I agree, Ayla. And I think that, you know, unfortunately, while combat can be a low hanging fruit, combat has this there's this there's this double sided sword which is a double double uh, double edged sword because combat also can't be too deadly because if it's too deadly then you know you're going to die <laughs> so it's like it's this weird kind of balance because it's like wait a second isn't this supposed to be tension filled and dramatic and we don't know what's going to happen it's like yeah but it's a combat so we kind of know what's going to happen like we kind of have to win because if we don't win, that means we're all dead. If we're all dead, the game's over. So the game wouldn't really want us to do that. And the GM probably isn't going to throw something at us that's going to cause a TPK. So it kind of is self-defeating in that way. I don't know if that makes any sense, but check on S up. Uh, there, I listen, I, I spent many, many, a long time uh, with my buddy um, <laughs> camping the... Uh, uh, the ancient crocodile um, <laughs> as well to get the uh, the sleeves, the gator, gator sleeves, gator scale sleeves, gator scale leggings or something. I don't remember, but we used to camp. We used to camp that all the time. Good stuff. <laughs> um, I mean, if you die, yeah, you, that's true. If you do die, you'll probably remember it. Maybe. Um, 13th age retreating rules are great for this. 7th C rules are great for this. Like, I guess the question is, when it comes to combat, would you rather have a game where death is death? I mean, you know, there's resurrection magic, I know, but like, you know, you're dead. It's, it's problematic. <laughs> um, and it's real death, but that means that, you know, you you the, the, the game system itself mechanically is designed for you to win 95 plus percent of the time. So you losing and getting killed is like a very much a black swan event. Or would you rather play a game where it's like, nope, every fight is really a 50-50 shot, maybe 60-40 at best. You know, if the players are really, really advantaged, they might be like, you know, 60, 60 or 65 percent to win. But they got to make all the right choices. This is really more of an even pairing. It's like a, it's more of like a football game. But because we accept the fact that losing and dying 35 or 40 percent of the time or 50 percent of the time every time we have a combat encounter is not really acceptable we're going to introduce rules or mechanics that allow players to have a way to extricate themselves in a narrative fashion from the the moment of death whether that's you know oh they somehow survive or everybody can run away and yes like the, the the villains plans advance and the heroes uh find themselves stymied it's not just oh we'll just do it again and we'll just keep, you know, Zerg rushing the encounters until they're dead. Um, but then but then if you do that, you have to accept the fact that at any given moment, the players might fail. And that means that your carefully crafted adventure could go to shit real quick because you were, quote, you can no longer count on the players beating every combat encounter. And of course, they're going to get to the chamber with the guy before the resurrection magic. And of course, they're going to stop the evil witch before she completes her spell. And of course, they're going to stop the evil queen before she, you know, because they're going to get to that moment. And it's like, no, no, my people didn't even make it past the front door. But then every combat is way more like, oh, <laughs> like there, there's a lot of skin in the game. I don't know. Um, 
but you know that is it is what it is um so so many good things i'm finding in 13th age i believe this is the first game to take my favorite fantasy 20 crown away from the fanny craft wow that is that's a big moment there um Traditional narratives like books and movies are based on characters failing almost every time. Exactly, Bernardo. To build drama, and that way the final victory feels really earned. I mean, the, you're absolutely right. The classic scenario is the players, the main characters, kind of kind of lose, 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 win at the end. And like in D&D games, it's like win, 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 win. And it, it, it's like very different from what you would expect and ever experience in a normal game. Um. So, yeah, <laughs> right. This is why we don't, this is why we don't make adventure paths. Exactly. Um, yeah. 30 days is a fantastic game. Happy to have you people all playing. It's a great, it's a great kind of stepping stone into this world of, of narrative concepts and ideas. All right. We are going to wrap up 1030 here. Three and a half hours seems long enough. We're going to be back. I don't know when, uh, to do a second follow-up to this. Um, Darth Gorlock technically gets to decide what our Tuesday stream is. I think he had an idea, but Maybe we'll let that Thursday. We're going to be back doing books. Um, we doing all books rated. Um, all my books. There we go. GM, oh, look at that. Up, oh, up. Oh, what happened to that PC? Oh no! It looks like they are just completely dead. My favorite. One of my favorite lines of all time. Uh, you are the bull in the player character's china shop. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> We got a lot of books to go through. Um, happy to have everybody here. So hopefully you sign up, like, subscribe, ring the bell so you can get notifications, especially for these Sunday streams. We're live Tuesday, Thursdays every 7 p.m., but sometimes we do Sunday streams. Sometimes we do Friday streams. You got to be got to be aware of that. Um, but if you want the most uh, up-to-date information, make sure you check out our Patreon, patreon.com slash Knights of Last Call description below, along with our drive through RPG affiliate link. That'll get you all the information you need to get us uh, to get you supporting the Knights in the way that you know you should. Um, we'd love to have you come in and be part of our community. Take a look around, see if it's for you. Learn a lot, play some new games, talk to a bunch of people. Um, maybe join Northern Reaches and maybe join a community game. Maybe just get really, really involved um, with RPG discussions. Maybe ship post a bunch of memes, you know? Whatever you want to do. Um, we're a pretty nice little niche community and we really appreciate it. Appreciate you. Appreciate all our patrons. Thanks again to everyone who came out and supported us tonight. Uh, big shout out to GM Scott for the uh, uh, significant uh, tip that made him the hype boss even up until the end. Uh, love you, Scott. Can't wait to buy you. Can't wait. Can't wait to drink more of your mead and, and buy you a shot or two in Columbus here. All right, everybody. Uh, I am going to be out of here. I'll see you on Tuesday, but I'll see you around the Discord if you're a member of the uh, Patreon and... Uh, We'll uh we'll see you next time. A night's of last call. Peace out everybody. <laughs>